here. Great. Yes. Okay. And uh, we have the pleasure to have the first speaker, Professor Olafur Arnolds, who is the father of soil science in Iceland. And uh, he has frequent collaboration with the soil con conservation of Iceland throughout her, his career. And he has been the lecturer at University of Iceland since 1984 and uh, one of the main lecturers of UNESCO Groland Restoration Training Program. He has uh, done his bachelor in University of Iceland and then masters in Montana State University and PhD in soil science in Texas University. Welcome, Olafur. Thank you. <laughs> so, Oli, I will open your presentation here. We are already sharing. And the camera is also on, so you know it. Yeah. So, and we will make this small and enable editing. And yeah, one more thing is that you can have the talk a little bit longer. We can. We can, of course, a little bit prolong the session. It's no problem. Thank you, Oli. Yeah. Oh, is this your coffee? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was asked to talk about a little bit about the permafrost in Iceland and frost activities and so forth. And this is, of course, going to be very superficial. But uh, there is, uh, of course, um, a lot of information available uh, elsewhere. So please let me know if you want something more. But um, the permafrost in Iceland is, is a black box. We know it's there at high elevations. But we know it's um, pulse areas are, are, are uh, widespread in some places and really interesting. But all of Icelandic nature is affected by frost, and much more so than most other countries, and I'll explain that a little bit. Then these systems, they are uh, under steady input of dust that sort of sorts Icelandic nature from other ecosystems in the neighboring countries and elsewhere. Uh, and I emphasize that this dust activity has changed over the past uh, hundred years, century. And the question what climate change will do to uh, the, the, the frost affected areas, that is something that needs much more research. Uh, we are at the Arctic Circle, warmed up by the, 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 the Gulf Stream, but um, it, the, the temperature in winter is really a lot around zero. And we're not unlike Finland, we have winds and the temperature is ever changing. And that means that uh, we have these frequent freeze thaw uh, events in Iceland. And they are much more frequent than in words. And they were called the Icelandic a cycle by Wasper, which is one of the oldest cryo uh, science uh, uh, yeah, guy, wrote a big book on it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not like Finland. It's just up and down and up and down, and you don't have to stay here long to experience it. Uh, and this map really illustrates quite well how separate we are in terms of the soils and that and comes to ecosystems as well. We have this uh, soil of form in dust and, and also in volcanic gas, but the dust is made of basaltic glass, more or less, in various forms. And the soils that form in these kind of materials are anthosols, volcanic soils. And this dust uh, has been accumulating over the past 9,000 9, years. And when we have uh, volcanic tephra uh, within uh, the, uh, the profiles, we can actually date things quite nicely. Uh, 
But the nature of volcanic soil is that they are very porous, they are light and porous. And that means isolation. It's really hard to put electrical cables, for example, down in, into these kind of soils because they uh, doesn't just dissipate the heat from the wires. So it's a problem for in that sense. But it makes them very fertile, but lacking cohesion. Here's one of the models trying to figure out how much permafrost there should be in Iceland. This is a bit old though. I'm not sure there's a lot of activity, but this is all foreign. There is a, the Kajafu group uh, in Svalbard and Norway and elsewhere that is trying to figure this out. But I, I, it's pretty, pretty obvious that we should have permafrost at the higher elevations. Whatever permafrost is, it depends on how you define it as well. And uh, it's, um, you know, how deep should you go to find the ice? Usually it's one meter that people use as a reference. But all of the surfaces are modified by soil frost, like these hummocks that we call tour, which has become an international concept. And uh, they are very unlike the hummocks formed by vegetation per se. This is uh, heaving, frost heaving, and, and that is causing this directly. And then you notice that the vegetation on top is, uh, becomes very different from the vegetation at the bottom. And heavy animals, as a sheep to some extent, but especially heavy animals like horses and cows, they really accelerate the process of formation. And um, uh, they, these landforms, for me, they're just absolutely fantastic in many places. You see the sheep that the arrows point to, that you give the scale of some of these features. They, they can be really big and absolutely astounding. Uh, we have the needle ice, which is something that prevents uh, uh, the barren ground in Iceland to uh, revegetate or, or, or heal on its own. We want to cover it with biological soil crust to begin with, and then something else comes along. And this is widespread in winter. Uh, you just have to dig in into the soil, in frosty night, and you'll find this in frosty morning. And the pattern ground, which is, of course, soil frost that causes this. And this is at about 800 meter elevation. And most likely, there's permafrost underneath this landscape. People don't know. And then the pulses. Pulses are large mounds in the, on the landscapes that have a solid ice core permanent solid ice core, and then there's the active layer on top, and there's a part of it is thawed out in summer, and uh, then it freezes again. And these, these systems, they're mostly protected in Iceland. They're hugely important for wildlife because the variety of, of <laughs> you see, you have dry land, you have lakes, you have wetlands, you have everything within a few meters and these kind of things. So like bird life and these kind of uh, uh, landscapes, it's just amazing. Uh, and they are not researched more. We published uh, one or two papers on this, especially these pulses, which are unusually large. And then the waters around them are also quite um, interesting because you see these lot of colors, blue colors, red colors, which indicates uh, interaction of microbiology and soil mineralogy that would be very interesting to investigate in more detail. And the strange thing about the Icelandic pulses is that there is no peat on top. It's not peat, it's, it's maybe four or 5% organic matter in it, but the dust provides the, you know, the soils that provide the insulation needed. But for this to, to form, you need flowing groundwater, a lot of groundwater. And if you have enough and it's cold enough, we have a different type, a similar sort of, these are called pinkos, and we don't have pinkos in Iceland. They're in Alaska and Siberia. And this is a, 
uh, radar uh, of, of the ground that there needs some of these pulses. And the ice core is often up to six, seven meter thick. But these areas are slowly pouring out. We found out that these particular pulses have probably been stable for thousands of years, which is unusual for pulse areas. Usually it's a cycle. They, they form and then they thaw out. And when they thaw out, you create uh, these lakes, circular, mostly circular lakes. These are all pulses, the lakes you see on this photo. And uh, pulses have been flowing out in Iceland now for the past many decades. Another photo of the Horavat pulses in Northwest Iceland, we're looking at Hofsjökull at the distance. And uh, again, I really like this area. It's so uh, variable it's for many senses. But then we have the dust and dust sources. And this is from Pinky Center, uh, close to the research sites that we discussed yesterday. And um, we know that today, most of the dust in Iceland is coming from these hyperactive sources, but not entirely, but these are, yeah, produce the most. And we have estimated the amount to be between 30 and 40 million tons per year on average. One model uh, suggested down to five, but I don't think the model is actually modeling the emissions from these sources. They just don't get it, these, these models are older. The Green's model is gonna get, be a lot better for, for uh, quantifying, uh, quantifying this. And as somebody said yesterday, up to 300, thousand ton in single storms, that, that is not that unusual. And these are kind of landscapes that produce most of the dust on, at the margins of glaciers. This is not Dinky Center, this is Mælifell Center, north of Mýrdalsjökull. And also the ocean shores and areas along the rivers. Uh, but there are like seven, eight areas that are by far the biggest contributors to the to the dust production. And then these kind of areas are of course analogs for what was happening during the large glaciation that produced all the thick lush layers that are the breadbasket of Europe and the United States today. And this is a famous photo from Loftmyndir, uh, of one of the particular, these are actually sediments, uh, old sediments, lake sediments that are being blown away. And they will be depleted in like 50, 60 years or so. I think it's best to leave this area alone, <laughs> even though it's quite, quite a lot of dust that comes from it. So on the left, we have the situation, what it was like two, 300 years ago. And most of the dust being blown around Iceland there was a redistribution of dust because of ecosystem collapse in the country. But of course, the were dust sources like today. And of course, volcanic ash, when it hits the ground, is redistributed, like we saw after the recent volcanic activity in AFL with Le Grimsvart. And from the desert areas, all the desert areas, when, when the wind is crazy, when the wind speeds go up to 20, 30 meters per second, everything becomes unstable if it's barren. But today, the major dust sources, uh, the big arrow on the right, uh, are contributing the most. The reason the soil red distribution is much smaller today is that most of the easily eroded soils are just gone. It's collapsed. We destroyed the country. And the ash redistribution is bigger now because we have larger deserts. So volcanic gas now falls on much larger desert areas of barren ground than they used to. And the sandy areas are bigger. So we have a change. And of course, talking about uh, 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 permafrost and uh, periglacial uh, conditions, this dust falls on glaciers and snow and accelerates the uh, melting 
But that, of course, is a, something that is not on my paper. That's OPM and others that talk about this. But it has been shown that the dust that falls on Icelandic glaciers has uh, accelerated the melt rate of the large glaciers. Every spring, every summer, around uh, you know, 15th of August or early August, the mass balance hits the previous year and is dusty. And so uh, uh, the rivers are really hard to cross in the late summers in Iceland. Uh, so this was a very short uh, uh, introduction to these kind of uh, issues. But we have permafrost at high elevations, but sadly we don't know <laughs> the distribution very well. Maybe it's not important, but I think it is because now with thaw we are getting landslides on unstable slopes in the tertiary areas in Iceland. So that's uh, something that has made permafrost studies in Iceland much more important. Uh, we have the magnificent pulsas. And they are melting. And the ones that we have had for thousands of years, they are melting too. So it's a really sad effect of climate change in Iceland in that sense. Uh, but of course, I can't emphasize this enough. All Icelandic surfaces are modified by action of frost. And we have the steady dust input from the uh, unstable surfaces. That has changed over the past century or so. And uh, permafrost has become le less prominent in the coming century. Dust will increase. And uh, there is a research focus now by a group at the University of Iceland to look at how, how uh, the uh, uh, landslides will become much more common and they're dangerous and they will take lives in the coming decades. We've got very close to some uh, events like this uh, over the past 10 years, really big ones. And that's not going to stop, that will continue. And that was it. We can on time. Really exciting. A presentation I actually remember from the field campaign we were in Dingyu Sandur that we have experienced several landslides in the Askia Caldera, yeah. really noisy and yeah. the sinkholes and everything. So, are there any questions for Oli here in the room? So, OT? Yeah, I, I would have actually two questions. First of all, uh, you mentioned that the balsas are protected in Iceland. Does it mean that the access to balsa area is? Restricted or no. how how is it protected? No, it's well, it's protected from like uh, vehicle uh, and, and you can go there. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Research them and so forth. But it's also because of uh, this. Every other person in Iceland with money wants to build a dam and produce electricity or and make more money, and uh, so these are threatened by all sorts of pressures. Yeah. 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 So in that sense, they yeah. are protected. So if there is a law, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great news. Uh, then uh, you uh, mentioned that the retreating glaciers are creating new dust sources, if yeah. I understood correctly. Or, so do you think this is like in Iceland, it's more important process than permafrost causing uh, new dust sources to appear. Well, increasing these major dust sources is has pros and cons. I mean, uh, this is making Iceland fertile. This, we have a yeah. very fertile yeah. ecosystem from this dust, yeah. basically. The oceans thrive on this dust, probably. Uh, so in that sense, but from the sense of people breathing this stuff, it's bad. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but most of these dust sources are a, a bit far from human, you know, large towns and so forth. So I don't think it's an imminent big threat. Yes. yes. But we should monitor it. Yes. And what is the role of glacier smelt compared to permafrost thaw in, in, in dust? Oh, it's mostly glaciers. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yes. Yes.
Thank you so much. And thank you for the most interesting podcast. Thank you, Olte. So there are two more questions. So Frank was first. Uh, I actually have a question about the change from dust sources. Uh, does the does the shift from the kind of uh, medieval age dust source to these kind of point source dust sources uh, lead to a change in vegetation because of a change in uh, content of the dust, or are they the same content? And yeah, yeah. In a way, the con the con the dust composition has changed. It's more raw basalt glass. There was a bit of um, organic material and other stuff, olefins even, in the dust from coming from soils. So in that sense, but but this basalt <laughs> dust extremely fertile. You can use it to fertile your lawn and it will make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And Ellie, please. Um, thank you for the talk. You mentioned needle ice and biocrust and you had a, a picture earlier in the presentation. How does um, biocrust interact with carbon layers in ice? Um, uh, uh, Needle ice is not a thing in the, the, the pulsar mires because they don't have a bare ground. So that's not a problem. Unless and that has happened when you start grazing horses like they did on, on these particular pulsars, they created little erosion spots. And then you get needle ice into it and then you can actually destroy the pulsars. But you still get them off. Uh, by legal access and modern mechanism. Okay, hopefully. Yeah, I would ask everybody to mute the microphone. It's much more comfortable. So if there are any questions online, please raise your hand now or we will proceed to the next uh, speaker. Are they? Just let me see all of you. I don't see any raised hand. Okay, Oli, thank you very much. And now I would like to invite Annika Rode from the Carlos Rue Institute of Technology. And Annika will talk about, let me, uh, talk about the, actually low latitude that's coming towards the uh, high latitude. So I will leave the title on you and uh, let me just stop this presentation of Oli and it shall be like this and start here. The floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, thanks Pavla for the introduction. I'm happy to be here for a second time now at the workshop and I'm bringing new results. Uh, my topic is the impact of aerosols on the optical, optical properties of snow and I'm focusing on mineral dust. And um, this opening slide shows you one example of mineral dust on snow. This picture was taken in the Alps. And you can clearly see the deposition here on the snow and how it changes the color. So this leads me to um, my motivation. So as you know, mineral dust is a very abundant um, aerosol in uh, the atmosphere. And in Europe, we get um, on several occasions every year, Saharan dust. And here on the left hand side, you can see one example. This is a satellite picture from fe uh, February last year. And you can clearly see the transport of Saharan dust to Europe. And this picture here shows, um, it was taken at the ground in Switzerland on the same day. And you can see how severe the color change is. And the concern with these um, mineral dust particles in the snow is that it Low, uh, darkens the color of the snow and this leads to enhanced absorption of solar radiation. And this can affect the evolution of the snowpack, especially in springtime. And here is one example from Skies and Painter from 2019. They did uh, simulations with the snow model and they included um, measurements of mineral dust concentrations in their simulation, which is the upper figure here. And then they did also a reference simulation where they excluded the dust. And you can see that the snow cover disappears much earlier in springtime with the mineral dust particles. And in their case, they found um, an advanced snowmelt by 30 days. So this impact can be quite large. 
Um, so before I get to um, my results, I would like to explain to you a few important facts about the snow albedo to understand this process. So here are figures from Skulls et al. from 2018. And you can see here the spectral snow albedo, so how the snow albedo looks in the different wave things. And shown are here different processes that affect the snow albedo. So first of all, on the left-hand side, we have the influence of um, light absorbing impurities, so the aerosols on the snow. And with a higher um, concentration of these aerosols, we get a lower snow albedo. And this is mainly important for the visible range. Then right next to this figure, we have um, another process, uh, which is the snow aging, or also called snow metamorphism. Um, when we have fresh snow, we have very small snow grains. And when they get older, these snow grains grow and the optical properties change. And this dark blue color shows you old snow. And as you can see from this figure, old snow has a lower albedo, and this mainly affects the near infrared region. Here on the right hand side, you can see measurements of the snow albedo and you can see that both um, wavelength ranges are affected. So we have to take both processes to, uh, into account when we want to simulate the snow albedo. So the aerosols and also the snow aging. So now I get to the model. So I'm working and developing the model ICANN. Um, this model was developed developed by three different institutions uh, in Germany. So we have the Max Planck Institute, the German Weather Service, and the KIT who are, are working on this model. We um, do the operational weather forecast with this model, um, but you can also use this model for climate simulations. A special feature of this model is that it consists of a spherical icosahedron. So we have a triangular grid. And this makes the model seamless. So you can run it on global scale, but you can also have very high resolution on regional scale. And then there's the module ART, which was developed at the KIT. And this module deals with the aerosol. So um, it can compute the emission, transport, interaction, and deposition of aerosols. And we include different aerosol species like mineral dust particles, volcanic ash, and so on. And here on the right hand side is just one example of the forecast and this shows March last year and here you can see also the transport of mineral dust to Europe and you can also um, look at the forecast um, on the WMO STS was web website. So now I'm getting to the snow darkening effect and how we account for it in our model. So I showed you that we have the emission, transport, and deposition of the mineral dust in our uh, model. And the snow darkening effect is a new development that I implemented during my PhD phase, um, which I finished last year. So I implemented different new processes. First of all, I introduced a new prognostic variable, which is the snow grain size to account for the snow aging part that I explained. Then I also introduced the computation of the spectral snow albedo based on the theories of Wiscombe and Warren from 1980. And I also implemented a dust transfer in the snow model between the snow layers. And here on the right side, you can see two sketches which show why this is important. Um, so when we have aerosols in the snow and then we get new snowfall, then, with, um, then the aerosols can travel to deeper layers so we ha can have a clean snow layer on top of it. And when we have snow melt, then the aerosols can move to a upper layer so the aerosols can resurface and concentrate at the top where this interaction between snow albedo and mineral dust happens. So the last point is that I implemented this interaction of mineral dust particles and the snow albedo. This is also based on the theories of Warren and Wiscombe. So now I would like to show you results of a case study. So this uh, is focusing on an event that happened in uh, 2018. There was a lot of Saharan dust, which was transported to Eastern Europe and also Western parts of Asia. And you can see here two um, pictures from this event. So first of all, you have here a satellite picture where you can clearly see the dusty snow compared to the clean snow. And here on the right-hand side is also a photo taken in Georgia, so a little more, bit more to the east. And also here you can see how severe um, the dust event was. So I applied an ensemble simulation. So in total, I performed 80 simulations and they divide into two different experiments. 
So first of all, I have the experiment where I turn on this interaction between dust and uh, snow albedo. And then there's the reference experiment where I turn off this interaction. And the difference between those two experiments gives me the impact of the manure dust particles. I simulated 10 days of this event at a horizontal resolution of 10 kilometers. So now I would like to show you some simulation results. This will be a um, small animation, but I would like to tell you uh, just shortly what you will see um, when I start this animation. So on the left-hand side, you can see the dust deposition in the top layer during the simulation. And on the right-hand side, you can see the impact on the surface albedo um, due to the mineral dust deposition. So this is the difference between those two experiments. Blue color shows you a decrease in the surface albedo and red color shows you an increase. And it is also important to note that I applied a snow mask, so you can only see the surfaces where we have a snow cover. You will see that um, dust will accumulate very fast on mountain ranges, but later on you will also see that there will be a lot of dust along the snow line. Um, so now I'm starting the animation and you can see the dust deposits on mountain ranges. But later on, you can see that here along the snow line is also high aerosol concentration. And here on the right hand side, you can see that there's also a strong signal here of several percent um, decrease in surface albedo. And also here in the mountain ranges, here's the Caucasus mountain. Here we have also a decrease in surface albedo. You can see that in several areas here, we have also red color, so an increase in the surface albedo. And you might think that it's a, it's a bit contradictory. And these increases in surface albedo is due to changes in precipitation patterns in our reference simulation. So here we get an increase in snowfall. This leads to a higher snow albedo. But we um, applied a statistical significance analysis and we found out that these increases in surface albedo are not statistically significant. So this is what I'm showing you here. This is the same plot from, from the last slide showing you the difference in the surface albedo. Um, this is the result after seven days. And you can see that we have only blue color. So only the, the reduction in the snow, uh, surface albedo is statistically significant. We also looked at different other variables to see the feedbacks. And we found out that they are regional dependent. So if we look, for example, in this region here, here with the Caucasus mountain, so here marked with A, we find that we have a strong signal, so a strong feedback in snow depth. We get a decrease of minus 1.36 centimeters here. But when we look at another region marked with B here, so here is uh, the snow line, so a thin snow layer, we get a less strong signal in snow depth but we get a strong increase in surface temperature. So a warming of almost one Kelvin. So the difference between those two regions is in A, we have complex terrain, we have a deep snow layer. So all the energy that is absorbed due to mineral dust particles, they go into melting of the snow. But in B, we already have a very thin snow layer. So this additional energy is also used for snow melting, but it is more likely that the snow cover completely disappears and the ground below the snow uh, is uncovered. And so the, the, the ground can heat up more. So here we get a strong signal in the surface temperature. This relationship can, uh, we can also see when we look um, at different variables and the albedo change. So here are shown three different variables. So on the left-hand side, surface shortwave net flux, in the middle snow depth and on the right hand side surface temperature always compared to the changes in surface albedo. And on the left hand side we see a quite linear relationship between an increase in shortwave net flux to the decrease in the surface albedo. And also we get a quite linear relationship um, when we look at the, the, the difference in snow depth. So we get a decrease in snow depth when we have a decrease in surface albedo. But when we look at on the right hand side at the surface temperature, we see that this relationship is not, um, is, uh, not, uh, is not linear, so it is more complicated. So we get an increase in surface temperature when we get a decrease in surface albedo, but um, the results are spread towards um, the whole quadrant here. So there are different influences which are also affecting the surface temperature. Is surface temperature two meter 
No, it's surface, it's the skin it's temperature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this leads me to my conclusion. So I'm telling you the most important facts here from my presentation. So I showed you how we account for the snow darkening effect in ICANN. So it's an online interaction. And I showed you some results of a case study. So we found statistically significant reductions of surface albedo and snow depth and a significant increase in surface shortwave net flux and surface temperature. And what is also important is that we found different feedbacks in different regions. So in complex ter terrain, we found mostly the reduction in snow depth and in flat area, we at the snow line, we get an increase in surface temperature. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Yeah. This brilliant presentation <laughs> nicely explained. <laughs> so, do we have questions here in the room? Yes. So, okay, please. <laughs> Thank you, Annika, for for most interesting presentation and brilliant work. So, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, you mentioned that you implemented the snow grain size. So. Uh, what is the biggest grain size? And are you speaking about optical grain size or the physical grain size in your model? I'm talking about the optical. I'm yeah. not looking at the physical, only yeah. the optical. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the biggest that I allow in the model is two millimeters. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that is uh, then the diameter, not, not the radius or? It is the radius. Really? Yeah, it's, Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, that's the maximum that is allowed. Yeah, yeah. I know okay. that, that it's a, a little bit big. Yeah, but... but I'm happy because you know in Finland we have really big uh, oh. optical grain sizes. Okay. So most often uh, we have grain sizes that are ignored everywhere. Ah, so okay. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. <Yeah. laughs> okay, that's cool. And then. Uh, your images about albedo, uh, you mentioned in the beginning how complex albedo is and wavelength dependent, etc. So those images that you showed, the modeling results, are they like the, the normal, like the pyranometer 400 to 900 nanometer uh, results or what is then the albedo that you showed? It is, um, yeah, it is from, um, so it's a, a little bit, wider the range it's okay. i think from 0 0.3 to 1.6 i think okay, micrometers that's also very cool. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah and um yeah we have 18 bands yeah. so we average over these 18 bands but we have 18 bands in the visible range um yeah this is also yeah okay. quite detailed yeah okay well done and then uh, I guess Mitchko is now, I hope, yeah, he is in the audience. So uh, are you like developing together with him with this uh, snow darkening uh, scheme? So Mitchko is already. Yes, I already have uh, some questions. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's really uh, impressive result, Annika. I, I'm really happy that uh, there is a group uh, dealing with, with the uh, snow darkening. Uh, uh, my, Question, uh, I have a few questions. First, are you going uh, uh, to publish or you already published the, these results in the uh, article? So I, I want to publish, it's on the way. It's not published yet, but it's okay. close to publishing. But it's of, of course, it's um, published in my PhD mm -hmm. thesis as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'm interested in at least for your PhD text uh, uh, and we can discuss uh, mm -hmm. after this meeting. The second thing, I raised the question uh, uh, of darkening yesterday in my presentation, uh, you have different dusts, or, or better to say, different colors of, of the dust. So if you look uh, the the uh, Icelandic dust, it is quite dark. Uh, albedo doesn't go more than about uh, 0 0.2. And uh, in Africa, in Sahara, this is uh, between, let's say, two or three to six sometimes. So we are thinking in our group to somehow make a differentiation uh, on, on the color of the dust, because that's not uh, the same if we have one dust, a dark dust, and a lighter dust, uh, the consequences are different. Uh, uh, do you somehow 
consider or maybe in the future consider uh, the, this this effect to be included um yes this is a very important point um at the moment i in, in my simulation i work with um something so optical properties from saharan dust mm -hmm. um but in the model we use like the um me properties so you can uh, do me calculations from refractive indices and that's what we use so when we have the refractive indices from from other aerosols we could also include them in the model um so you could so it's not implemented at the at the moment so you have to provide the 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 optical properties but then you could use this also in the model okay and the last question uh did you have any any comparison with some uh measurements some uh, insight uh, observations or this this is just a model uh, run results uh unfortunately i don't have uh, measurements on this event mm -hmm. that's just the model uh, result okay we, we, in general i think the models have to think about to 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 uh find uh, groups uh, doing at least some measurements that, uh, so, so, so that we can validate our results, of course. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I'm really satisfied with, with your presentation. Thanks for the question. Yes, Thank I have you. one more <laughs> comment. So I, I think we need to do a collaboration with the fieldwork team and with your model because uh, we also have the dust events in Finland and yeah. we have results from that. So we, oh, great. That, that would be one test case possibility. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, Ellie, I have a couple of questions if there is time. Um, yes. So, um, for your albedo measurements, you, you mentioned using, I think, spectral absorbance, uh, adapting methods from a 1980s paper. Um, did you also use any remote sensing methods for albedo measurements, like any GIS based? Uh, no, uh, um, in, in my work, I didn't use any, um, yeah, remote sensing um, data. Do you think that would be useful, or is it not very effective? Yeah, I think it oh, definitely it would be useful, but it is always a little bit difficult when you look at satellite data. Um, I think there are some indi index, uh, but you often the satellites. See something different it's always a little bit difficult to compare those um, data i think um, for example black carbon i saw also a paper it is for example very difficult to distinguish if you see um, the ground mm -hmm. below the snow or if is it aerosols on top mm -hmm. so it's always a little bit difficult with um, remote sensing data but i think of course when you compare it or find something an index where you can compare it and that would be definitely useful great and did you think about quantifying snow melt in relation to the albedo thing um i mean i i did this also in 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 this work like i said that the snow depth um Oh, yeah, so, uh, reduced yeah, yeah. i didn't look at how much water is it uh, it's no water equivalent but you could do this no. unfortunately there's no hydrological mo uh, model implemented mm -hmm. um this would also be interesting but it's not no, thanks couple so one more question alejo <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the nice presentation is there any estimate about the, you know, the impact of this uh, perturbation in dust dynamics or uh, in the uh, in climate change, like at the global scale? Like thinking in the realm of if dust is increasing and dust has a clear effect, you know, beating, like in comparison with other. I'm not a dust expert, so maybe that's something that is useful. But in comparison with other phenomena, what's the radiating force of that? Um, I think there are some papers on it, and always diff it's. I think it's hard to estimate. I, I sorry, I cannot give you numbers for it. Yeah, yeah no, but, but like, um, like in the IPCC report, for example, like 
Can you help me out? I don't know. <laughs> the newest IPCC report. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 substantial, like it is something that in the coming decades that does uh, more and more emissions are going to impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I, I think currently there is no direct reply or answer to that. Uh, I discussed uh, with our chief uh, scientist of FMI, uh, Ari Laaksonen, Professor Ari Laaksonen, uh, uh, about dust events taking place in Finland. So my talk will be about a rare event of the, uh, Tahran dust in Finland. And I was asking him if uh, he, as a climate modeler, sees uh, any, uh, anything that uh, uh, would affect the future of Finland that we would gain uh, more Saharan dust, for example. And he said it's too complicated uh, to estimate anything. So uh, at the moment, for example, for Finland, uh, that cannot be estimated for the future. So uh, the processes, like, uh, like Annika said, they are like uh, you have regional phenomena, you have temporal variability, and, and uh, yeah, it's hard to give estimates. Uh, and also, of course, it's dependent on the winds and everything. So it's rather complicated. Uh, you can, you that, can say that, that, is, that is exactly what all like IPCC and everybody said about. Soils in the beginning, you yeah. can measure it in tree trunks to soils. No, it's a black box. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and how entirely wrong they were because yeah. the soils, of course, are much more important than the trees. Yeah. And yeah. the tree planting is, of course, used to 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 create monocultures around the world because just because they can measure tree trunks and have That's lots right. of negative environmental yeah. impact. I think yeah. we can do this with the dust as well. Mm -hmm. It takes an effort. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. by the way, these simulations, they were absolutely amazing. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anna, come once again. And yeah. I think we shall proceed. We are a little bit late what now. Was your so, talk, uh, last meeting we had, what was your talk about then? Kian. Yeah, yeah, it was about that, but I didn't have any results at that time. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. The beautiful progress, progress of two, three years. Yes. Congratulations. So, Congratulations. so and uh, now. Oti Main Ander from Finnish Meteorological Institute will have her presentation. I will just prepare it here. Hopefully, stop share. But it's enough just to escape it normally. Like, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but it's there. So we will then share again. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's because it was in the ah, it was mode. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Your presentation doesn't want to leave us. <laughs> <laughs> and Oti mm. here. Yeah. We have to share again. So I'm really happy that we had Annika's presentation first. So I'm continuing uh, with the same topic, but from a different perspective. So I'm speaking about the processes that are behind such modeling approaches. And uh, my talk is divided into two parts. So first I will talk about the dust and cryosphere more in general, and then I will present the rare event of Saharan dust uh, deposition on snow in Finland uh, last winter, 23rd of February. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues of Saharan dust team in, at FMI and the uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. So uh, when we speak about dust and cryosphere, uh, we can have many phenomena related, but uh, today I am concentrating on effect of snow uh, impurities on snow density, uh, bidirectional reflectance function, spectral albedo, diurnal albedo, and melt and insulation. So first of all, about the density effects. So this is a paper uh, based on a suit on snow experiment we had a couple of years ago in Sodankula, Northern Finland. And we have actually had such experiments several times. Uh, the latest experiment results have not been published yet at all. 
So uh, from this uh, experiment, uh, we found out that uh, soot and, and dust can decrease the water holding capacity of melting snow. And uh, this was proven uh, in this experimental setup in a natural snow surface when we deposited certain amounts of soot and Icelandic dust on top of snow surface and observed uh, the whole season when, when the um, snowpack was evolution uh, during the winter. And uh, this uh, we can explain also using laboratory experiment with we, which we did and it supported the same result. And uh, with uh, empirical results elsewhere, so what is the reasoning behind this density effect? Uh, is first of all the semi-direct effect of absorbing impurities. So the evaporation or sublimation can cause air pockets and therefore lower the density. So that is one option, one explanation. Secondly, the melt-freeze metamorphosis, as mentioned also in, in Annika's talk, uh, uh, it can affect the adhesion between liquid water and snow grains, and that can then cause decrease in liquid water holding capacity. The third effect is then uh, on the snow grain size. This is an analog to soil science I, I, I have understood. So when we have larger grains, the water just simply goes faster through, through the grains. So it's the same for snow and, and soil particles. Then we move on to albedo effects and uh, a similar picture that Annika showed, but a little bit different. So here we have from Hadley and Kirstetter uh, publication, an image where we can see different snow grain sizes. So from left to right, uh, the snow grain size increases. And uh, we have uh, different wavelengths in the x-axis from uh, 400 to 900 nanometers. And we have different impurity contents of black carbon this time. But black carbon is actually quite uh, similar to volcanic dust of Iceland, for example, for, for the absorption properties. So uh, what we can see is that when we increase uh, the impurity content, so the color indicates the impurity content, uh, blue is clean snow, and then uh, we have more and more uh, impurity as, as the albedo as a function of wavelength decreases. So it is not just one number we are speaking about when we mention snow albedo, it is wavelength dependent uh, and it is uh, snow grain size dependent, it is impurity content dependent, and here is only one impurity black carbon. We have also organic carbon, we have also dust, we have algae, we have all kinds of impurities. And all these impurities have their own mass absorption cross-section, which affects uh, the albedo. So it's really rather complicated. So what we did uh, regarding uh, albedo and uh, bidirectional reflectance uh, in this suit on snow experiment in Sodankula was that we had a figifico goniometer that uh, has ASD spectrometer attached to it. So it measures the reflectance uh, in different view, view angles. And here in the left uh, figure, we have uh, an overview of the snow. So we had these different spots. We had clean snow on the top left, volcanic sand, and there is an enlarged image on the, on the right panel. And then we had soot and silt, and silt is from Iceland as well as volcanic sand is Iceland. And these two types of sand and silt, they are different in color as uh, Onichko mentioned. Uh, so also in Iceland, we have different color of dust. They are not all that black. Some are very light gray, some are yellowish, some are black. So there is also difference in, in Icelandic dust as well. So what we can see in the right figure is first of all, an image showing the bidirectional reflectance function in yellow and then the curves. And uh, then on the right panel, there is the albedo. So what we can see from here is that uh, basically uh, the A here up is about the clean snow. Then we have the same uh, impurities as in the left panel. So volcanic sand, soot and silt. 
And there is not that much difference uh, except in silt, which differs from the others. Uh, but uh, this is now one time measurement. So it doesn't contain uh, the information of temporal changes. So temporal changes, as mentioned also in Annika's presentation, they are very important. So there is an ongoing metamorphosis in the snow. And especially when we put impurities in the snow, the metamorphosis starts immediately. It uh, is also metamorphosis is ongoing all the time. So even though we see snow and, and it looks like stable, it is not stable. So there is all the time, it's like almost like an organic thing. It is amazing. So uh, there have been some simulations on how snow cranes actually, what is happening inside snow. So it's really fascinating. So here we have an image where we have on the left panel, the, uh, the bidirectional uh, reflectance function first method. And then in the middle uh, after some time, so uh, like the last one of, of one day, and then we have the nadir reflectance on the right panel. So you can see that there is a huge difference, first of all, uh, according to the time. So there is a temporal change and it is angle dependent. So it's about where you are viewing. That is one question related how we can compare satellite data with the modeling results because they are actually measuring very different uh, parameters. So uh, this is uh, related to that problematic that there is in, in uh, satellite data usage. So for example, this study shows uh, that uh, BRDF information is crucial for the usage of satellite image for albedo detection. Because if you have impurities and you don't know which angle you are viewing it, if the satellite is looking nadir, it doesn't see uh, any of the phenomena that are related to the impurities in snow. So the right panel here shows the nadir reflectance. So it is totally different from the other panels where you can see the effect of the viewing angle. And also there is a journal asymmetry in natural snow related to the aging phenomena that Annika described. So even though we don't have any addings of any kind of impurities, it is according to time that we have spectral changes, we have diurnal changes according to the solar zenith angle. So if we have the same solar zenith angle in the morning or in the evening, we actually in the nature, we have a different uh, uh, state of, of snow albedo. So uh, modeling is also, <laughs> challenge with this kind of phenomena. So this is totally natural. And this uh, was recorded using Bentham spectrometer in Sodankula. So it is uh, highly reliable uh, results. And uh, we calculated uh, with the Livratran trans trans radiative transfer model that the uh, diurnal 10% is uh, solar zenith asymmetry, which we detected here, and which we actually have detected also in Antarctica, Maran Biodata. Uh, that uh, this kind of error causes a two to four percent it's a daily error for satellite snow albedo est estimates. So these are the error ranges that we are dealing with. And then uh, the last effect uh, is either we have melt or insulation effect and that is related to what Jan spoke yesterday. So if we have a tiny amount of dust on top of snow, it causes a melt effect. So this is like, effective thickness of one to two millimeters. But if there is a thicker layer of dust on, on top of snow and ice, it starts insulating like Oli uh, told us uh, in the beginning of today's session. So uh, there is an insulation effect of, of volcanic uh, particles. Okay, and now I will move to the part two, which is about the rare event of Saharan dust on snow in Finland. So this event uh, uh, took place when the whole country was covered with snow and therefore the dust deposition was more easily detectable. On average, Finland receives Saharan dust once a year, but it is observed as, as uh, sunrises and sunsets, which are red in color. So we don't normally notice it. it's there, but we don't see it really. But this time uh, it was uh, a bit uh, wet deposition. So we had snow and we had uh, rain. 
in the southern part of Finland, so that's why we could detect this phenomena. And it could, uh, it was modeled with a SILAM, FMI SILAM model. Uh, and it was forecasted uh, quite well, I would say, five days in advance. And uh, on the ground, it looked like this. It's nothing compared to uh, Switzerland, what <laughs> Annika showed, but it, this was really amazing for Finnish people. So uh, it was really visible and uh, people started contacting FMI. So uh, as a weather service office, uh, we were uh, contacted and asked what is happening in Finland? Is this the end of the world or what is it? Because nobody had seen such a thing to take place. And uh, then uh, FMI communications asked me to uh, provide some information uh, for the public and uh, how we did it because it was so quick, we had to react very quickly. So I used Twitter for this. So I tweeted on, from my account and FMI put them, uh, my tweets in the front page of FMI. So that, that way we could reach the citizens. And also the meteorologists in duty, they announced uh, what is happening in the weather forecasts in television and radio. And in addition, uh, I prepared uh, uh, instructions how to collect samples if people want to participate to do science. So this became a citizen science project. And it was actually quite successful. So uh, people followed the instructions that I prepared. So I asked people to collect snow and then prepare the samples either by filtering snow, decanting, or evaporating with, um, uh, with heat, so uh, on an aluminum folium, and then send us the samples. And this is uh, does the research in Finland. So where did they evaporate the samples? It was in sauna. <laughs> so, so this is only in Finland. I would say this is quite exotic. We have Saharan dust on snow, which is evaporated in sauna. So. <laughs> And where did we receive these samples? So we got 525 letters from people and they were really up to it. So they, they provided us with several samples. So for, for example, one person could send us 10 samples with a poem even. <laughs> they, they were having these rhyming endings. <laughs> It was so, so crazy. And yeah, this came like a huge event and it was a positive event in Finland in the middle of COVID crisis. So it was really something that people wanted to join. And uh, SILAM then from the science part uh, was used to research this event. And uh, this is afterwards. So I showed you, uh, you the forecast, but this is now afterwards. And uh, we have not only the atmospheric columns, but we also have the deposition results. And uh, this is nice case for SILAM uh, modeling verification as well for dust, uh, because uh, now we have wet and dry deposition separately. And we know from our data uh, that we only had wet deposition. So SILAM succeeded here, not providing any dry deposition to Finland and providing wet deposition in the right places. Now, the next question is if uh, the particle size uh, are, are collect, correct. So we will analyze the particle size distributions from the samples that we have. And uh, we wanted to check about the origin, although we knew from the satellite image and from, from the forecast that it would be, but. Uh, uh, let's say that uh, SILAM footprints agree very well with the satellite uh, data. And also one uh, interesting feature is that when doing uh, split modeling, uh, we can see one trajectory from Russia or Estonia coming uh, to Helsinki and Tampere region. And uh, this is interesting because part of our samples, they are dirty dust. So they are not orange in color, but they are dirty, but they are among these uh, samples that we have. So uh, we assume that we have dirty dust in our samples. And the precipitation type can be studied using the Harmony Arame operational uh, weather forecast model uh, used in FMI and uh, the rain uh, and uh, 
freezing rain and snow deposits and agrees well with the citizen science observations. Of course, one question with uh, citizen science is that if we receive samples, does it mean that we have reached these people living in these places and we just didn't reach those who are living other elsewhere? So that is one thing we cannot be sure about. But what we can be sure about is that we would never have gained so much samples in any other way than citizen science. So I think for, for modeling purposes, this is really a nice event. And Calypso data we would have used if, if possible, but the clouds were preventing, so we couldn't use. So we have also studied some uh, uh, microscopical uh, samples. And uh, what is interesting here is that we might have also microplastics along the samples. And then if you look at the letter E, there is like a coronavirus. <laughs> you see there is a spike. <laughs> spiky circle there in letter E. So maybe some, maybe not coronavirus, maybe some other virus, but anyways. So there is an offer for the biologists to join also for, for this work. So there is some biological stuff definitely among the samples. And uh, some of course may be due to the sampling method. So it may be originating from the samples on the ground, but it may be also airborne. So that is the task for biologists to, to do. And we have studied the collection technique biases because we use the coffee filters and the coffee filters release the smallest particles through, but we have an idea now uh, what we are dealing with when we have the coffee filter samples. So we have the largest particles and this information can be then used for studying uh, the transport of huge particles and uh, what went through, then that is uh, a different story and, and we can only utilize those uh, evaporated sauna samples for, <laughs> for studies like that. And people who sent us samples, they also wanted to know what we do with their samples. So they, they were sending us letters asking, please tell us what you do, what you find, is my sample Saharan dust or what is it? And, and that's why we created newsletter. So we have now given out two issues uh, explaining what we are doing with the samples and uh, one extra newsletter because there was an, an event uh, expected to come to Finland. Uh, it reached Iceland. I think Pabla collected possibly some samples so, uh, this winter, but uh, it, uh, it never appeared actually in Finland. But yes, so this is our way to give back uh, because we can't reach everybody separately. I mean, 525 people, it's impossible to send emails to, to everybody separately. So we, we just use this newsletter for that. So as a summary, so we have from this Saharan dust event, we have ground truth thanks to the citizen science. And we have also, um, in addition to the citizen science samples, we have additional frozen sample collection that uh, I and my colleagues collected. So they are still in the freezer. So they are kind of our most precious samples and uh, we are keeping them safe. So the image in the right shows one sample collected by citizens. So uh, I, I, I think the color matches quite nicely with the Saharan dust mm -hmm. and the amount is actually quite amazing. So the modeling part here included that uh, Silam could forecast nicely the event five days in advance and the model wet and dry deposition agrees well with the citizen sample locations. Remote sensing we will use, uh, we try to use from ground to sky using salometer and LIDAR data as a next step because we couldn't use Calypso. And then uh, SILAM source analysis will be continued and the particle size distributions for SILAM verification will be made. We have also a team at FMI for ice nucleation ability of the particles, so they will utilize these uh, particles for their studies. And uh, dirty dust is my business, so that is <laughs> what I will do next. So thank you so much. Amazing presentation. So do we have questions here on site or comments? And here on online. 
I don't see any hair in trace, and I'm aware that we are really late. So yeah, we had a really nice discussion between yeah, Annika yeah, and my yeah. talk. So, <laughs> so yeah. we would basically suggest because now we are a little bit late. Uh, well more late <laughs> but uh, to take a coffee break until 14 30 and start the next session five minutes later or shall we just have 10 minutes break 15 minutes is better 10 minutes all right so minutes, it means yeah. we will start on time the second section at 14 25 okay good thank you thank you and i'm stopping recording so i am starting record now and i would like to share invite to share uh, invite daniel bellamy to share his screen with us daniel is from uh, university of montreal and he will have his presentation on um, aeolian transport and atmospheric boundary layer dynamics in saint elias mountains in canada so daniel the floor is yours awesome everything looks okay Yes, it's full screen. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, thank you for letting me contribute here. Um, yeah, and today we're going to be talking about the uh, an emission site that you've seen previously in the in the workshop yesterday, which is in the north in northern Canada, uh, in the Yukon, the Slims River Valley of the Ichu. But today we're going to be looking at more so some some transport events, but mainly looking at the, the atmospheric boundary there and trying to sort of piece together the dynamics we see in this complex terrain. Um, this work forms part of um, the Canadian Mountain Project with the PI James King. And this project is um, has a lot of, it's a multi-method approach to identify emission mechanics, um, the physical chemical properties of the dust, uh, impacts on sort of uh, terrestrial ecosystems through deposition, but also trying to model um, and but this work presented today just constitutes is just these two sections. So we're going to look at um, a transport event and dune formation during 2021, uh, the field campaign most recently. And then secondly, we're going to look at some of the boundary layer dynamics uh, taken in 2019. So those are the two aspects of this presentation today. Uh, this is our study site situated in the southwest Yukon in Canada. Um, you can see that this is, it's on the leeward side of a, the coastal mountains here, the St. Elias Mountains, um, one of the largest coastal mountain chains going. Um, and similarly, on this leeward side of the mountains, you can see that it's in the, on the receiving end of a lot of fluxes coming from this large ice field that's present. Uh, the ice field ranges, which is the largest non-polar ice field uh, going. So this obviously results in this proglacial area results in receiving meltwater, sediment deposition, but also some of the winds we associate with um, glacial systems. This obviously this area has has been studied for successive years, and this is just this is just a breakdown of um, the event log of when we see emissions, and you can see that emissions here are extensive throughout sort of spring and summer and into into early uh, autumn. And largely unconstrained by sort of conventional seasonality controls due to the river diversion that took place here. Um, so emissions we see are, are largely possible throughout this this snow free season. So the first aspect today is, is just to have a quick example of this activity. Uh, so this is taken from 2021 and I'll direct your attention first to the to the scans on the right. Uh, these are two um, SEMs uh, topography scans taken from taken by drone and you can see that at the end of May um, this delta region of the valley or this outwash plain largely flat previous year it had flooded um, so when we came this year and expected to try and find um, you know some nice elements some nice roughness elements in the landscape largely gone however by the before the end of June we'd seen the formation of a constrained but decent sort of dune field you know with these dunes on the order of 30 40 centimeters and this largely happened over the course of about a two-day period. And this was um, from, about June, from June 25th into June 26th, uh, where we see, uh, we saw a very large event. And over the course of this event, you can see that um, our attempts at sand traps uh, got, <laughs> got largely swallowed by the dunes that emerged and started advancing on our main uh, tower site in the valley. So that's just a quick example of, you know, this, this activity and emissions that we see at this site. 
And now to break down sort of the meteorology of, you know, the winds driving us, where is this wind coming from, in order to understand why these emissions are happening. And the most, the conventional sort of approach for understanding the wind is just that these are these winds are down valley drainage winds, you know, produced over the glacier and draining out through this proglacial valley. And we see this, we see this activity a lot, these emissions from the, these southwesterly winds, um, from the delta and outwash plain out into across the lake um onto the other side of the shore however we also see the the opposite in activity you can see here that we see sort of extensive dust storms instead of heading up valley um and in addition to this there is a, a host of sort of complex behavior that we see just in this valley alone um where we can see a substantial significant disconnect between essentially the winds flowing down valley um these southerly winds blowing down valley while also seeing similar sort of winds from almost a westerly direction uh, driving emissions on the delta. So, and to understand these flows, we need to start breaking down some of the mechanisms, the meteorological mechanisms that we see in complex topography. So this plot here, I'll just take you through it quickly. So these are, this is plots of wind direction taken from a surface station. Uh, on the y-axis, you can see the wind direction plotted from zero to 360. Uh, on the x-axis for each of these plots is time of day or hour of day. So these are hourly average data for periods of three months. And what this shows is essentially that during early spring from March to May, um, from about 9 a.m. onwards, we see that the southwesterly winds coming from the valley towards the, the surface station here, it's, it's distinct. It's a large part of the climatology. These are really strong down valley winds coming out the valley from about 9 a.m. to the late afternoon, about 8 p.m. And we can see that this similarly persists in summer months as well. Taking the same plots, but instead plotting wind speed, um, we can see that this, um, this uh, diagonality in the wind direction uh, coming from this valley is similarly complemented by increasing wind speed. You know, this diet, so this diurnal increase in wind speed during the late afternoon is similarly characteristic of sort of late, uh, late April, May, and obviously during summer as well. So here we're going to mainly focus on the May period, which is when we see, for the most part, we see the largest emissions um, following some of the loss of snow cover and exposure of sediment. And the question here is if we see this diurnality in wind speed and wind direction, is this just sort of firmly driven flows that we know are created within mountains? Um, so the addendum to that is if we take a look at the what's happening on the synoptic scale. So what's happening in the winds above the mountains? So this is just the last 30 years uh, climatological average for wind speed and direction uh, taken at 750 HPA. And we can see that these winds are consistently well aligned during this conventionally dusty period, this dusty month. And if we take a look at the one of the largest events we saw during the 2019 fill campaign uh, was an event lasting approximately 34 hours. Um, we can see that A, these winds are well aligned and strong throughout this event. And similarly, the peak in emissions happening happened in the early hours of uh, the 27th of May. Um, so what is the role of firm, like how can we ascribe, um, you know, these firmly driven mechanics to this type of emission behavior? So the question here is, what's the toss up between these dynamic forcing and these firmly driven flows here? Um, and based on this, this, uh, this project's investigation has, has changed several times, but it consists of a multitude of meteorological stations distributed throughout the valley and camera sites. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the Doppler LIDAR that was situated at the research station here in 2019. And we're going to start to look at the, the vertical profiles and wind speed and direction. So this plot is, it's, it's a plot of wind direction. You can see that on the y-axis is height and the x-axis is hour of day again. So this is average over the month of May. Um, this, an addendum to this obviously is the situated at this research station in the top right-hand corner. Apologies if that's a bit small. It's about six kilometers away, um, it's, which may not seem a lot, but, but given the sort of really complex topography and, and the mountain scales, there is there are questions related to the representation representability of this and how this would hold up for how similar this is to emissions you know on the 
to areas on the order of 10 kilometers away. But just to do a quick breakdown of what we see through this, like a kilometer or so of the boundary layer, you can see that during the morning, we see these distinct northerlies coming down the valley, coming down the larger trench. Um, and these are consistent until the mid morning, where surprisingly we see that instead is sub subsequently replaced by a southerly flow that instead comes up the trench and works its way down. However, the main focus of, for the purposes of dust investigation, the, the afternoon period is the focus based on this diagonality that we saw in wind speed. Um, looking at the surface, we see consistently southwesterly flow um, coming from the valley and being picked up by the LIDAR situated at this research station here. Um, similarly, we see that if we look up through the profile for, to about a kilometer or so, we can see that wind direction is pretty consistent through this time. We don't see any sort of, um, we don't see any reversal of flow or anything. So can we start, to, can, we, can we rule out, you know, if this is just dynamically driven, mixing down of momentum, we can't really be sure yet. So just to focus in on the, just to take that apart and just look at the, the top 600 meters, Again, as we as we suggested, we see through in the morning, it's distinctly southerly winds potentially coming from the valley or not, but it's this afternoon period where we see these strong down valley, we see these strong down valley winds coming from this angle of about 240 degrees, finding the LIDAR. So if we start to, if we want to investigate this, we're going to break down this plot and index it by dust activity. So here we've selected for the days of greater than 12 hours of observed dust, observed dust activity just based on the event log for this period. Um, and this is, I think, 14 days out of 30 of them was this. And we've done the same plot and averaged it over, done hourly averages for each um, to find out what the profile looks like during these major dust events. And for the most part, you can see that this profile is largely similar to the previous. Um, However, for in terms of if we look at the lower sort of, unfortunately we can only get to about 60, 80 meters with the LIDAR. That's our, that's, our, that's our minimum height. But we can see that during this period, for a large portion of the day, we're seeing consistent sort of winds coming from the valley. Um, but, and, but a larger contrast here is that um, during this afternoon period, we see that it's, it's not, it's a tad obscure and based on the number of measurements it, it may not be um, it may not be consistent, but we can see that there is a there is a bit of a larger difference based on what we see at the surface and what we see above in terms of wind direction, of an approximate change of about sixty degrees, which is not unreasonable to suggest, but it's it's a hint that maybe the surface is becoming increasingly isolated from what's happening above. And if we do the the contrary, and instead select for the remaining days indicated here, sort of with the grey indicating emission periods, uh, so these periods. We can see that during, on these days, the, the time that we can observe winds coming from the down valley direction is, is much lesser. So we, and we're really failing to see this down valley activity um, during the afternoon when we're interested in it. Instead, this is really being dominated by uh, the larger sort of flows coming down um, the trench from a northerly direction. Um, and you can see that during this afternoon, contrary to the previous plot, the, the winds, the wind, by wind direction, it seems to be pretty well mixed, as in these wind directions are pretty consistent throughout the length of the profile and exceeding sort of the ridge height of the surrounding mountains. So the final plot here is just taking a look at the wind speed, um, taking using this two index of the dusty days and less dusty days, can we identify any changes in wind speed for the profile? And one notable change is if we look at sort of this period during the nocturnal boundary layer, we see that on dusty days, uh, the wind speed here is is markedly elevated than less dusty days. So it's it's possible that we're seeing less stratification in the nocturnal boundary layer. However, otherwise, besides this, there's not really any distinct changes or differences during the late afternoon that are that are significant. And this hints that sort of the indexing we've used here and the categorization is a bit too coarse for this application. So rounding off, um, two items to look at moving forward is understanding the importance of these regional circulations in the in a wider trench and wider mountain range. And these are largely driven by synoptic behavior. And what's so important to us is the drainage winds and the, the more local firmly driven flows that can persist in this valley. 
And secondly, in this value where season, controls on seasonality are largely been lost and emissions are largely persistent throughout almost half the year, um, how does the seasonality in solar insulation, you know, so the changes in radiation at high latitudes with the seasons, how does that influence the formation of these firmly driven flows? And resultantly, how does that change these emissions? And that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, the topography is an extremely important part of, of the research. I have to say we have similar experiences here in Iceland with uh, totally um, diverse condition and just few meters away in the same uh, dust source. So I will ask if there are any questions here in the room. I don't see any raised hand, so let me check the chat. Yeah, no more, no questions. So thank you, Daniel, very much for a really nice presentation. And we will proceed to the next speaker. And that's thank also going to be given online. And the speaker is this, uh, Professor Silvia Nava from the uh, University of Florence in Italy. And she will give our second presentation on Antarctica. And it will describe source identification of mineral dust to Antarctica, Sidatra. So Sylvia, I hope you are yes. here with us. Thank you, Pabla. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to share my presentation. Let me know if uh, you can see it. Is it okay? Can you see? I guess so, yes. I can put it in yeah, the now it's better. mode. Now it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, this uh, very nice workshop. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, mineral dust transport to Antarctica uh, and to describe the Desidata project. It is uh, a, an Italian PNRA project. Uh, it involves uh, um, different research groups. The one I belong to, the INFN, National Institute of Nuclear Physics, and also the physics and chemistry departments of the universities of Florence, Genoa, Perugia, and Torino. First of all, a very short introduction. Uh, mineral dust, uh, has uh, plays uh, an important role in climate change. Uh, it, it is not necessary to, <laughs> to tell uh, it here. Uh, and uh, dust particles uh, uh, reach the inner part of Antarctica, mainly after long range transport from desert and semi-desert continental, continental areas of the Southern Hemisphere the so-called PSA, potential source areas. And so uh, for this reason, uh, the, the study of mineral dust uh, in, uh, in the Antarctic Plateau is very important because uh, from the analysis of the composition of mineral dust uh, there, uh, we, we can try to find which are the, the most important sources. We can identify the, the main uh, PSA and the contribution. And so we can obtain important information on uh, the transport of mineral dust uh, in the South Hemisphere. We can do it uh, at present, uh, uh, analyzing the, the, the aerosol which is present uh, in Antarctica now, but also we can do it analyzing the, the mineral dust which is trapped in the ice cores. And uh, of course, uh, we, we, um, we, we should consider that uh, we have uh, important, we can have contributions uh, also from the uh, snow free areas of, uh, of Antarctica. Uh, we saw it yesterday in, uh, in, the, in the presentation that this contribution uh, is uh, maybe important and uh, maybe also increasing. And so it will be interesting also to, to, to find the contribution of uh, the local dust. 
And uh, uh, okay, I, I work in uh, an ion beam uh, analysis laboratory. We have a small particle accelerator and uh, we use ion beam analysis uh, to do elemental compositional analysis. And so I would like here to stress uh, that uh, the, these measurements are very useful for the analysis of uh, soil dust elements because uh, with this kind of uh, techniques, uh, it is possible to simultaneously detect all the elements uh, with atomic number greater than 10. And they are very, they are in general very sensitive techniques, but uh, in particular, they are high sensitivity. We have a high sensitivity for mineral dust elements. Uh, and also we do not need uh, any pretreatment of the samples. Uh, and so this is important for the uh, samples from remote areas, of course, because we, cannot, we, we do not introduce contamination. We can put the samples as they are under the accelerated beam and analyze them. And uh, this is the, a picture of the lab that uh, we have here in Florence. And uh, this, this experimental setup have been optimized uh, in order to obtain uh, a, a very high sensitivity. The, we, we use this, uh, let's say, uh, to, um, mainly for two purposes. One is uh, a night throughput analysis of a nine number of samples to study particulate matter in urban and industrial areas. And, uh, the other, the other phase, we can use this uh, feature to analyze uh, uh, very low mass samples, samples with, with, with very small quantities. With this uh, sensitivity, we can analyze uh, samples collected in remote areas with uh, uh, areal densities lower or of the order of one microgram per square centimeter. And uh, uh, we, we use this uh, to analyze samples from uh, ice cores. And uh, you can find this, uh, this uh, publication. And, uh, oops, sorry, okay. And uh, from the analysis uh, of, uh, of uh, samples uh, collected in the framework of the EPICA project at DOMC, and also at uh, EDML, uh, we, we found uh, that uh, uh, what we know, we know uh, that uh, the, the ice dust composition, uh, the, the ice dust uh, is uh, concentration is higher during cold stages and the chemical composition is more similar to the composition of uh, soils, uh, sediments from the South, South America. But uh, uh, while glass, glacial conditions are uh, more known, uh, the, the interglacials and also the, the present situation is, uh, is less known. So source areas and transport processes of dust particles to inner Antarctica at present and in the past interglacial periods are still not enough known. So for this reason, uh, we, we did also some preliminary applying these uh, PIG-CPG techniques. We did some preliminary studies also on present day dust uh, quite uh, some, some years ago. Here you can see some pixie spectra obtained by the analysis of PM10 collected in DOMC. And uh, you, you, we can see that uh, most of the soil elements can be well detected. And by this kind of analysis, we can obtain both a, a, an estimation, an experimental estimation of the total soil dust concentration, because we can, we, we measure almost all the major component of mineral dust. So if we do a sum of the oxides of these elements, we can obtain an estimation of the total mass. And uh, we, we, as can you see, the, the concentration, the, the total dust concentration in, uh, in the inner part of Antarctica is very low. 
From this analysis, so we found that these concentration are of the order of the nanogram per the cubic meter, so very low concentration. And also it's interesting to see the composition because for example, uh, in this graph, you can see that the, the, the silicon aluminum ratio, which can be obtained by pixie analysis, shows some differences between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, winter and summer, and also between uh, um, glacial and interglacial periods. And also it's nice in this graph, you, you have also some points that uh, have been obtained by the analysis of samples from Australia and South South America. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, the, 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 compos the ratio, the silicon aluminum ratio is uh, during uh, summer is more similar to the ratio uh, in uh, uh, that we obtain for the Australian uh, soils, okay? But while the composition, the, the ratio during winter is more similar to that uh, of uh, uh, samples collected in uh, South South America. So in, uh, in this uh, project, uh, we, we want to, to go deeper in these uh, kind of investigations. Uh, to find uh, the, the present day sources and transport processes, supply mineral dust to the Antarctic Plateau. Uh, we want to characterize the composition of the mineral dust, identify major sources, and uh, compare the composition of uh, Dome C mineral dust with the composition of uh, soils collected in uh, potential source areas. This is uh, a schematic view of the, of the project. Uh, in this project, we did uh, both uh, samplings uh, in, uh, at Concordia Station at Dome C of both uh, PN10 and uh, snow samples. But uh, we also uh, analyzed the samples collected in uh, South South America and uh, Australia. We, uh, how can I say, we, we analyzed uh, these, uh, these samples uh, uh, with uh, different methods, I can show you. So um, the, the, for the sampling, uh, two twin samples have been installed in the atmosphere shelter of Dome C and the PM10 samplings are going on since the end of 2017. We uh, do this sampling with a time resolution of one month because uh, the concentrations are very low and so we need to integrate uh, the aerosol for a long period. And also to avoid contamination, uh, we, we use a, a meteor trigger to stop the sampling if air masses are coming uh, from, uh, from the station. And with the same frequency, we collected also uh, superficial snow samples uh, in the clean area. Uh, the, the two aerosol samples, uh, uh, have been uh, um, dedicated to different kind of analysis. One sample is for PIG-CPG analysis to obtain uh, the elemental composition. And the other sample is dedicated to uh, ICP, again for uh, uh, elements, but also for isotopic, uh, uh, isotopic measurements of lead and silicium. And for, the, for both the filters, uh, we uh, uh, measured both the, the total fraction and the insoluble fraction. I mean that we, uh, we obtain the, 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 the total concentration, uh, but uh, also the insoluble fraction by the suspension and collection of the particulate matter in ultra pure water. Uh, 
followed by filtration through a small area, nuclear pore filter. And uh, for the, uh, the, total the total fraction for uh, uh, ICP has been determined by standard mineralization of the filter, while the total fraction for PIXI has been obtained by an innovative method uh, because uh, um, for the, this kind of analysis, uh, you need to concentrate uh, the collected material. So the idea was, okay, we start with uh, a big filter and then we concentrate all the material on a smaller surface because the ion beam analysis is uh, sensitive to the aerial density of the deposit. And so if you reduce uh, the, the surface from uh, 60 square centimeters to less than one centimeter square centimeter, you increase the sensitivity by a factor 60. And uh, by this, I, I do not have the time to, to go into details, but by this uh, way, it was possible to obtain samples. Here you can see a picture. This is the end of the ion beam uh, channel. And uh, uh, by the, the, the analysis of this sample, we can obtain uh, spectra with good uh, statistics. And so it was possible to determine uh, all the main uh, elements. We did also some uh, uh, snow pit samplings, in particular during the 2017 summer campaign, we collected, uh, uh, we did uh, two snow pit samplings. Uh, one with a depth of four meters and the other one meter. And we collected uh, different lines for the application of both uh, ion chromatography and uh, ICP. And we collected the line also for PIXI. And uh, two years later, we also did another uh, snow pit uh, deeper, about five meters, in order to, to reach a second tie point for the dating of the line. And so uh, I, I will show just a few, few results obtained so far uh, during the project, in this project. And uh, one, uh, one is uh, one, one uh, of these results concerned the, the snow pit. Uh, we analyzed the, the four uh, meter depth snow pit by ion chromatography. And uh, also one line was analyzed by a nice sensitivity ICP optical emission spectrometry. Uh, is, uh, is an innovative method uh, developed by the group of Genoa. You can find more details in this paper. And uh, so uh, with the application of these two techniques, uh, we measured both uh, the, the, the typ ty typical ions by ion chromatography, but also these uh, elements uh, by ECP. And uh, what uh, we, we found that uh, uh, calculating the, 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 the sea salt and non sea salt fraction, we found that uh, sulfate uh, is uh, mainly non sea salt, uh, as we could expect. Uh, while sodium was confirmed to be uh, mainly from sea salt. And so it's confirmed that it is a good sea salt racer. And calcium was mainly uh, in the non-sea salt fraction. It was mainly of crustal origin. And uh, to, to date, uh, for the dating of the of these samples, we use the non-sea salt sulfate lab profile we identified this peak and we associate it to the eruption or the volcanic eruption of the 1992. And by this dating, we found that our samples correspond to the last 50 years. And we were able to give an estimation of the accumulation rate. It was about nine centimeters per year. 
and this uh, confirms that uh, the uh, accumulation rate uh, in the inner part of Antarctica is, uh, is very slow, it's very slow, yes, uh, it's very small, sorry, and uh, this is in agreement with previous uh, studies. And uh, um, we identified, here yeah, you can see both the depth and the year, and uh, we, we identified uh, many sea salt and mineral dust episodes. Uh, so we confirm that sodium is, uh, is a reliable marker of sea salt and calcium a reliable marker of mineral dust. And it was, uh, this result was strengthened by the detection of aluminum and iron by this innovative uh, uh, experimental method. So uh, putting together these two techniques, we were able to identify these, uh, these events. And Hello, I'm not sure the video is frozen. So is it on our side or? Sorry, I was too long, I suppose. N no, we just missed last one minute. So so was it, if you could sh show the last slide maybe once again? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 how long? Uh, because I don't know how, how much time I'm speaking. <laughs> time is good. Ah, okay. Yeah, this was the slide. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And uh, uh, okay, so these are first results from the analysis of the snow pit uh, samples. Oops. And uh, then I would like to show you some results about the analysis of uh, PSI. PSA samples. So as I said uh, about uh, we we. we we selected about 50 soil samples previously collected in uh, Patagonia and Pampas and uh, in, in uh, north-south uh, uh, transect in Australia. And uh, to compare the composition of these uh, soil samples to the composition of particulate matter in Antarctica, we had to, um, how can I say, to obtain a, a good comparison, we need similar size distributions. Of course, we cannot compare a bulk soil, uh, the composition of a bulk soil sample with that of PM10. So we, we, we set up uh, a, an experimental method to resuspend these, uh, these soils, these materials and collect uh, by aerosol samples uh, on filters. And in particular, at the end, we decided to use a PM2.5 inlet uh, because uh, the, the particulate matter which reach Antarctica after long range transport uh, is uh, strongly size selected for sedimentation. And so, uh, well, at the end, uh, we, we did some tests also with PM10, uh, but uh, uh, we produced most of the samples using uh, a sampler with a PM2.5 inlet. So far, we analyzed only a few samples, nine samples from Australia and four samples from South South America. You can see here where they have been collected. But the results are quite interesting and also they are in agreement with previous ones because we found that South South America samples are richer in sodium, you can see in blue, and in calcium, okay, brown, dark brown, while in Australian samples, uh, Australian samples are richer in aluminum and iron. You can see also from this ternary plot, uh, these uh, samples uh, in green, they are from Australia and the red from South South America. 
So you can see that uh, samples from Australia are richer in aluminum, while the others from South America are richer in calcium and sodium. Of course, these are too few samples, so, so we, we need to continue the analysis because they are uh, absolutely too, too few samples to conclude something. But uh, these results are uh, in agreement uh, with uh, the, the previous one I showed here. You can see that uh, this is the same uh, graph. You can see that this black one are samples from Australia collected, uh, I can say you can see in this uh, paper. And uh, the, the, the stars are uh, samples from uh, Patagonia, okay? So we are happy we, are, we, are, we obtained the similar results. And uh, then, uh, okay, I, I cannot show you um, uh, much results from the aerosol samples because the analysis is, uh, is still uh, in progress. We analyzed the samples collected in 2018 and the samples of 2019 are under elaboration. Uh, I, we, we confirmed a very low concentration. You, you can see the concentrations are of the order of nanograms per cubic meter for major crustal elements and uh, sea salt elements uh, for major elements and uh, picograms for the, for the others. And um, so concentrations are, the, are very low. And we, we did some comparison between soluble and total, and uh, uh, we, we found that uh, these elements, mainly sodium, magnesium, uh, calcium, uh, they are mainly in the soluble fraction. Then we, we started analyzing uh, some, uh, we did some uh, principal component analysis, but uh, this is uh, still in progress. Uh, I put here just to show that uh, we, we, we start uh, comparing these few data from uh, PM10 uh, at uh, Antarctic PM10 and uh, soil samples collected in Australia and Patagonia. And uh, we, we, can, uh, we can see some, uh, some uh, correlation between, uh, uh, similar to, to the correlation that we found in the past. Uh, so with uh, uh, winter samples, uh, winter of course, austral winter uh, samples uh, with a composition more similar to that of the samples from Patagonia and uh, summer samples with a composition more similar to that of the Australian samples. And uh, with, with this, I, I would like to, so I do not have a conclusion because the, the project is, uh, is in progress, but uh, okay, the samples have been collected and the experimental methods uh, and, uh, have been developed to analyze these samples. The analysis is uh, in progress. Uh, I hope that uh, with uh, the result of this analysis, we, we, can, uh, we can obtain some interesting information. And uh, I would like also to, to, to tell you that uh, uh, for ion beam analysis, we, our laboratory is now part of the ion beam centers of uh, Europe uh, within the Radiate project. And so if uh, there is the need of this kind of uh, measurements, uh, uh, it is possible to apply to, to the Radiate uh, uh, project for this. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your research, Sylvia, it's amazing. Isn't it the deepest snow pit ever made? Five meters? <laughs> yes, yes, because uh, the, the first one, sorry, I don't know how to stop share. Okay, perfect. Yes, we, we did the first one uh, snow pit of uh, four meters. Uh, 
um, but we didn't reach the second uh, uh, tie point and uh, the, the, the tie point of uh, 1963. And so we then we decided to, to go deeper, yes. Okay, so I guess we are now a little bit late, so we can allocate maximum five minutes for the questions. So I would ask you to answer uh, fastly, if it's possible. So do we have questions here in the room? Okay, so <laughs> no question here, but I can see Michko very likely would like to ask something, isn't it, for his Australian dust storm? <laughs> Uh, actually, yes. Uh, uh, I showed yesterday the case that we run with our uh, global model, dust model. Uh, this this was 2020 uh, January, and the sequence was uh, a strong uh, dust uh, storm in Australia, and uh, then immediate transport to to this part of of the Antarctica. My question is actually: Is there any? Uh, uh, continuous or, or sporadic measurements uh, uh, for uh, uh, for this part of Antarctica, you might better know. Uh, I, I didn't follow your presentation from the beginning because of other meeting, but I understand that, uh, well, you, you deal yes, quite uh, with, with I'm this. involved in sampling in uh, Dom C, Concordia Station. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we still did, didn't analyze samples from uh, 2002, but uh, we, we are just finishing with... Sorry, 2020. 2020, yes. Yeah, 2020, okay. sorry. We, 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 we are finishing the analysis of uh, 2019, and uh, just uh, last uh, week I was measuring, uh, but uh, we, we have to still to start with 2020, yes. So okay. I do not have data on um, on this interesting episode that you, you described yesterday. Okay, so uh, once you enter to 2020 analysis, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in uh, what we can do is actually to either rerun the model, although I don't think so that we should do this, but we still keep all the, all the meteorological and the uh, concentration fields in 3D or 4D, if you like. So... Uh, surface concentrations, profiles. Profile is also interesting, but I doubt that uh, maybe anybody is, is measure, measuring the uh, uh, LIDAR profile or, or so. But uh, even uh, surface concentrations could, could, uh, could help us. Uh, we, we just want to, uh, to, to finalize the, the whole uh, experiment uh, with a kind of uh, technical note, at least, because this was one run, uh, we have some material, but we need somebody on 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 the side of uh, measurements, uh, uh, people to 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 somehow uh, make some stronger conclusions. Yes, thank so, you. I, I can keep. Uh, okay, I will uh, take information about it. Okay. Okay, so we we, we can talk uh, more next uh, next uh, months or or so once you you have some data. Yes. Okay. okay thanks. Okay, thank you. I would just add maybe when you look at the sources from Patagonia on the way is Antarctic Peninsula, which is also important as source. So for the, like you call it uh, winter measurements, which means January to March in, in um, Southern Hemisphere, no, in Northern Hemisphere. Yes. Then yeah, that could be also maybe source to look at. I will show some data later. So I basically just will now continue with my presentation. Okay, okay. All right. I will follow it. So thank you once again. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so my presentation is unfortunately also a little bit longer than scheduled, but I'll try to make it really fast because I want to show the whole last year of our activities. <laughs> So let's see, just stop me if it's, if it's already too long. I will collapse this. Yes. So I will talk about the latest high latitude dust observation in Iceland and Antarctica and show also some results from some papers that have been submitted. So here is one drone image from the summer, which we spent in the Dengue Sandur as Carlos and 
uh, also Konrad and his team were describing class uh, yesterday. And yeah, in this in this presentation, I would also show maybe some conclusions of Anna Vukovic uh, results of, of, of the area, uh, size of the areas of high latitude dust sources, because unfortunately she cannot give um, the talk herself. So the outline is about the new paper on the collection of new high latitude, high latitude dust sources and their estimated areas, then the updates which I have mentioned, and then I have only one, two slides for each topic. One is the Saharan dust even in Iceland and the general trends in it. One slide is on Dingu Sandur field campaign, but from the point of the cryospheric part research. And the final slide is on the updates on the Icelandic uh, aerosol and dust association. So everybody knows the paper from 2016 of Joe Bullard and she, uh, first paper actually estimating and identifying dust sources in both northern and south uh, hemisphere. But Ote did amazing work and she collected over extra 60 new uh, high latitude dust sources from more than uh, 47 co-authors. <laughs> And uh, all these uh, new high latitude dust sources have, uh, have, have some kind of evidence provided that the dust activity is occurring there. The paper is still in review, but I thought it's good for you to know about it. The review has been closed and it wasn't rejected. So, <laughs> so I just want to let you know about it. And part of this really, really huge review paper also includes the, the uh, sand and dust storm source base map, which was initially made by United, for the United Nations Convention to combat desertification and focus the low latitudes. But when Anna used the same methods for the soil types and uh, emittive uh, areas, then, then of course the northern latitudes are quite important sources as well. And then she identified different sources in the high latitudes and south, but except unfortunately Antarctica, so only south comes for Patagonia, for so-called source intensity, SDS, sand and dust storms index. So the index is from zero to nine and something about five is already a very like potentially active uh, dust source. And based on the <clears throat> model she used, so she calculated the area of the high latitude dust region in north, which is over 64 million kilometers, more than half is covered as a land. And if she look at the source identific uh, source, uh, sorry, source intensity uh, level of five and more, then at least for the most like active dust years, when the maximum uh, is introduced that almost 4% of this total area actually is an active dust source. So over 1 million square kilometers. And the same calculation was made for Arctic region. It means 60 degrees north. And in this case, the area is a little bit smaller, but still the most, um, the area of the active high latitude dust sources during the dust enhanced activity, yes, would be over also over 1 million square kilometers, and that's at least 5% of the Arctic regions. And these numbers are significantly higher than previously was shown. But of course, we need more evidence. And here are two examples of, for example, new evidence of active dust sources. So one is made by Jan in Svalbard, and the other is already, you saw it from Antarctica. But for example, Kola Peninsula is another important source from the sailing ponds um, activities. So they are all over, even North Eurasia, Euro and we, of course, need more evidence from these remote places. And there are always new papers increasing on high latitude dust sources. So it's, it's a <clears throat> pleasure actually to collect them also under the Ice Dust Association website, under the publication, we have a new new opened uh, like a topic. So anybody who will publish or has published on high latitude dust sources or in situ measurements, please let me know. And it's going to be my pleasure just to edit. So, so of course I can miss some of these works.
So now the updates on the research. So as has been shown yesterday, so we had this really exciting uh, summer field campaign in Northeast Iceland. So this is about one month before we came there, when dust storms reaching the ocean. And it, the location was really specific because it was between uh, Askia Stratovolcano, the north top of the Vatnajökull Glacier in the, uh, in the south. And there was also the fresh La well, fresh lava, lava from the eruption of Holograin in 2014-15, which actually covered a huge part of the source itself, but it doesn't mean that it would make the source uh, less active or inactive. So as Carlos mentioned, there were 12 institutions from six countries. We had plenty of instruments, including the 12 meters tall tower. And this is our part of the research. So as Carlos showed the, the depiction of the place yesterday, so the main tower and setup of the most instruments was here. And then our part had also additional setup in so-called northern part of this, of this active dark source. We call this area camera because above it was also placed our camera, which is facing towards south. So it means towards the dust source, the lava and the glacier at the end. And the third location was on the scientific road. And here are amazing pictures which Oli did when he, when, he, when he visited us. So for example, this is from the scientific road. You can see us here, this three persons. This is the drone image from the tower facing towards south. So here you can see basically the lava in the back and the glacier. And this is again the tower region point uh, facing towards the west. So on this image, you can see the flat plain when it's not flooded. <laughs> the tower region, the uh, light, aerosol, uh, light optical aerosol counter at the camera place and the scientific road is somewhere here behind the lava. So we employ two instrument light, aerosol, light optical aerosol counter, which measures the particle number concentrations in 19 size bins from 200 nanometers, 200 microns. And it actually measures on two different angles. So it also provides the type of the, of the aerosol, the information on this uh, typology. And the second instrument we use was the uh, dust track DRX for mass concentration. So these are preliminary results. I have actually just received them. And this shows the LOAC at the camera, which was one of the most dusty places where we were there and very, very active at the beginning. But very often also there was a river, uh, river channel full of water. But just looking at the PM1, PM2.5, and PM10 concentrations, Considering what we have experienced, we would I would personally say that the concentrations are quite low because they reach like about 100 micrograms per cubic meter per one hour when we optically see really strong dust storms. And on the right are particle number concentrations and particle size distributions. So you can see the submicron particles are in highest numbers, but that's opposite what uh, what. Um, Carlos said, and I'm looking forward to his comments, but of course, I think he was showing the graph of the masses. So the larger particles naturally will have larger masses. And the other instrument, which uh, the other information which we have from the instruments is the, is the nature of the particles. So on the y axis, you can see the diameter, the size of the particle from one micron to 100, and the main main type, like if the particle is absorbing, semi-absorbing or transparent in green. So for the finest part in the, in the beginning of the measurements, you can see that's clearly dust particles, while for the larger particles of above micron, they also, they also include some liquid particles or more transparent. And this is also shown on different size ranges, but the absorbing and semi-absorbing are the most frequent. And these same graphs I can basically show you for the other locations. So then was the scientific road. So again, the one hourly concentration for PM10 seem rather low. And here nicely, also when, the, when there is a like close to zero concentration, we had some, some uh, electricity drop out. So, 
that doesn't mean it was zero, it just did not measure. And here you can already nicely see on the particle distribution, the lines for the clean, clean condition. And then when you have a dust dome, so of course the 10, 20 micron sizes are in higher numbers. And again, the semi-absorbing and absorbing particles are the most dominant, at least for the, for the particles below, below one micron and then over 20 again. And here is the info for the tower measurements where were the other instruments. And uh, again, the concentrations have not really exceeded the un, uh, uh, hourly means the 100 micro, micrograms per cubic meters in the size distribution. And here, yeah, it can nicely be seen the, the uh, uh, absorbing and severe absorbing nature during the main dust peaks. And this is the second part again from the tower when there were much more dust storms and you can again see the difference between dust storm and low dust situation. Second instrument we had was a dust track and sorry for the quality of the graph. So this shows the two minutes mean because when you, uh, you have to use auto zero module when it's, when, it's, when it's running for longer time. So you can see the PM10 masses are significantly higher in orange or blue ones for PM1. So PM1 two minutes mean exceeded two or even 3000 micrograms per cubic meter while PM10 reach up to nine in like distinguished peaks. This, for this period, 4th to 5th September, it also has been nicely captured by the dream model and also our camera, which in left part shows our, the, the tower in total cloud, while the right, right part of the camera is a little bit damaged by the sand because it's extremely erosive. But looking at other dates, the peaks actually reach up to 22,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So this yeah, gives the question, why is Lomak Loak under kind of underestimating because the dust track measurements, I think, and Carlos can and Conrad make me wrong or right, it's uh, similar to what FIDAS measured, at least when we were in the field. And this is low quality satellite image, but I was trying to zoom it for a nice, uh, nice dust plume. And that was exactly the September 1st when we had this over 10,000 microgram peaks. And this is from the field. So you can see 10 seconds uh, measurement showing really huge numbers. It's in milligrams. And actually this has confirmed what we once measured also in 2020 in San Kluftavat. It's a very small lake, drying lake, very close here to Reykjavik. And then during this one minute uh, mean average campaigns, we actually managed to measure concentration like over 50,000 micrograms per cubic meters for PM10. And this is just to show the floods, which uh, uh, Carlos was talking about. So here is our BSNE dust trap um, setup when we finish it on the left. And this is how it looked like after one night massive floods, which basically brought all over the, the region something about 25 to 28 centimeters of new sediments. And you can see buried lower uh, trap. So this is not the sand dunes, which was showed in Alaska. This is a flat new sediment. And here is the measurement. You can recognize the last layer by brighter sediments because usually at the top are the finest particles sedimenting. So that's the end of the last flat. And here are the same graphs for the James Ross. Uh, peninsula, uh, uh, James Ross Island, sorry, from this year, I mean, already last year, 2021 uh, summer, I mean, Antarctic summer. And uh, yeah, the PM10 particles, there was a clear, clear um, problem that they were obviously not entering the inland properly, but on PM2.5 and PM1, we see quite high concentrations. And there is nicely shown that most of the particles are absorbing or semi semi-absorbing in all sizes. And here are the data for 2021, showing actually compared to, you know, the image what is behind, the, uh, behind it, 
rather low concentrations, but again, with lower. But compared to 2018, you can see the PN10 reach much higher value. So we will try to apply some formula to correct the PN10s from 2021 based on the measurements of PM1 and PM2.5. And yeah, so I was giving another talk for the dust blowing south conference. And there was this nice event in November 12, 2009 in Antarctica, where the source was from Patagonia, created this amazing dust plume uh, over 250,000 square kilometers over the sea. And of course, posted by the best dust uh, reporter, Santiago Gasso. <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of confirming the, again, our our situation we had in 2018, James Ross Island is here, if I'm correct. <laughs> and uh, this is just a uh, Windy has implemented now aerosol information to their models. You can see also forecast, which is good with Windy. So here is a PM concentration, obviously reaching over 50 micrograms. But yeah, one needs to have the measurements there over winter and that's another issue. So, and now last five slides. So just to show you, because we had these two nice uh, uh, lectures today on the Saharan dust in high latitudes. So we look at the data from 2008 till 2020, and we also found there is on average at least one long range uh, Saharan dust event coming to Sahara. And we had two samples, and they actually showed really large particles arriving from Sahara up to 100 micrometers. So this is example of one sample collection from April 2019. And you can even see the, the, the impaired visibility in Iceland. Actually, for example, Akureyri, North Iceland measured PMs over, PM tens over 200 micrograms during this event. And then Yingyu Sandur field campaign again. So there was Aute also visiting and taking part in the cryospheric part of the campaign. So we were, again, I, I'm showing here the Askia Stratovolcano, and we were looking for the anything frozen. <laughs> so we took samples from, you can see this extremely dirty uh, endings of the glacier. So this was at, it's not on this map, but it was, uh, uh, it will come later, but one, 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 <laughs> one glacier tank. And then we have collected just on the camp of Drake, there was a buried snow, which, uh, which the ranchers estimated can be from the last winter or winter before. So we took sample there. And then because yesterday in the restaurant, we were talking about a sinkhole. So just literally in front of our eyes, they were like so, so frequently new uh, sinkholes even on the main path folk to the like touristic path folk. So it was a massive throwing this summer there. And uh, then we collected several samples, many samples with, uh, with ice, which is buried with two types of tephra from the stratovolcano. And one is very likely from 1961. So that's how the ice should be old. But the massive eruption was in 1875. So that's another samples we took was extremely exciting. And this is just to show there has been great study from also ice dust member Andre Gunnarsson, who is looking at the satellite albedo, but also using the albedo measurements from in situ stations on Batnaikut Glacier. And during the eruption of 2010 and 20, the glaciers were basically black, like all covered by volcanic ash. But in 2019, there was no eruption and this albedo reduction was purely just because of massive dust storm. So this is an image from August 2020 where you can clearly see the dust plume path over the glacier. Hopefully you can see it. And this is mainly this slide is for Nichko because he was asking for particular events to run or test his model. So that would be the difference in albedo between 1st of March and 10th of March of 2019. And the last slide. So the campaigns are <clears throat> finishing, but new campaigns are going on. So with, together with the HILDA project of Konrad Kandler and Kerstin Czepanski, there will be new well, continuous uh, field measurements now in South Iceland. This is our camera over over Mirdal Sandur in the south, so showing nice dust plumes there. So 
if somebody is interested, we are measuring from May to June. And uh, this is also actually quite interesting cryospheric areas because in South you can have snow dust storms. So the black thing is actually dirty snow. And latest updates about the Icelandic Aerosol and Dust Association. So we are growing in number and that's a great feeling and I'm so happy. So at the moment, we are actually 49 research institutions from count, uh, 19 countries and we have reached a level of 100 members. And yeah, there is at least 60 scientific papers now published on high latitude dust and the cryospheric impacts, but also health impacts. And last year we applied for the European Aerosol Assembly as a member and the application was successful. So congratulations on that. And I will come with more info on it, on it uh, when we have it officially announced. And the next High Latitude Dust Workshop, the number seven, will take on 14 to 15 February 2023 again here. So it'll be a pleasure to have you here. And don't forget there is still two amazing talks after the break. And one of them is also from our campaign in, in Dingyu Sandur by Maria Roon, an artist and scientist in one. And this is my final slide. So thank you for your attention and sorry for the long, long time. <laughs> so I guess everybody is very tired. So shall we go for a coffee break or? Or, or a quick question, I would say, if there is somebody. I can who would have like a look. Nichko, um, do you want to ask something? Or is it still from? Uh, yeah. No, not uh, anything particular, <laughs> except that I was enjoying your presentations and <laughs> my speeches. <laughs> okay, so, so I guess there are also no questions here. So thank you for your attention. And once again, we are now too late. So the, let's have a, what do you say, 10 minutes break? Because the last two, last two talks will be basically 12. 20 minutes should be 20 minutes or 25 minutes together. So, so I would suggest we take now 10 minutes and we will meet at 15. What is the time? 37, 15, 50? 15, 50. 15, 50, yeah. Okay. That's when Maria Rune will have a talk. It would be nice to take picture because they will leave later. Yeah, okay. I so am horrid, I yes. know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I love you.
Hello, everybody. So we are back here. And uh, now we will have our last very short session, which is more related also to the art. And it's going to be uh, the talks will be given by by our by the students. So I would like to as a so there will be two talks, one from Maria Rune. Uh, Traundar daughter from both uh, Agriculture University of Iceland and, uh, and the University of Helsinki at the moment. And second will be Natalia Burjova and she will, she's affiliated uh, to, uh, to the Swedish uh, mid Östersund uh, University and previously to uh, Czech University of Life Sciences. So let's start with Maria, who has really like a pioneer and a particular topic which relates science and art, and in this case, dust and art. So please go on, Maria. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can okay. see the screen. Okay. Um. Can maybe put it on full screen like f5 or be better like this yes fantastic thank you okay <laughs> yeah so hi i'm maria um i'm an icelandic artist and uh, so um last summer i got a grant from the uh from the icelandic uh, research fund um for students and uh, yeah so my supervisor was pavla and uh, the project was called um, the meeting point of arts and uh, dust research in Iceland. And so, um, but it was mostly about uh, me trying to find the sound of the dust stone. And so in this short presentation, I will uh, go, uh, or I will explain a little bit the journey towards the project. And then I will talk about the project itself. And uh, if I have time, I will, talk about what I'm doing now. And so, um, yeah, so I have uh, backgrounds in visual arts. Um, uh, and yeah, in the in my studies, I was always really interested in this uh, man versus nature topics in art and uh, environmental issues, and also um, using my emotions and my body uh, or like performance art, um, because I, yeah, I, I've been practicing dance for many, many years, and so uh, that somehow um, it's, uh, yeah, it's easiest for me to express myself through my body somehow. Um, but I've also actually been, always been really interested in uh, natural science. And for example, uh, in my high school, I was in the nature science department. Um, so now I'm finishing uh, a master's um, degree in environmental change in higher latitudes, it's called. Um, so it is a, um, a master science um, master, even though I have a background in BA. So, but uh, uh, I really want to include the art there. And so, um, yeah, my master's project will be like an intersection between art and science as well, where I will have an exhibition, hopefully, in uh, at the Finnish Meteorology Institute. And so here are just uh, some uh, old works. Uh, is, um, the Glorious Hour was uh, the graduation project, um, which was about um, the acidification of the ocean and then Kvervandi, which means uh, the one who disappears, um, was about how we are changing the landscapes uh, with, uh, you know, creating these hydro uh, dams. Uh, but yeah, the research itself, uh, the Rannis project was uh, to find out how does it feel to be in a dust storm and how does it sound like. And so um, <clears throat> uh, the project uh, started like with just doing some uh, uh, many experiments. For example, I like to use poetry and uh, 
uh, here in Harvard, for example, I, I went there and um, just described the colors that I saw just to get started somewhere. And then I was recording the sound and doing many performances where I was just kind of feeling um, the ground with all my senses. And by that, I mean, like, I, I listened to what I could hear. I, I tried to taste even the grounds and uh, I looked at the colors and uh, smelled it and, and uh, but uh, to go to Dinky Center where uh, I met many of you. <laughs> um, uh, here are many or a couple of uh, performances from that. And in this particular one, um, I call it popcorn because uh, there I'm <clears throat> eating a bag full of popcorn. Uh, and it was supposed to represent both at the same time, like a, an hourglass. So like in the performance, I eat the, the full bag. So it's like about climate change and how we have a limited type, but it's also about maybe consumerism or how we are looking at nature um, today. Maybe we think we are doing a lot, but maybe, yeah, uh, maybe we could do more, let's see. <laughs> um, and here was the one, it was like the first dust day uh, since I got there. And I was just like doing some experiments. And uh, yeah, here are two from like a, a very, uh, intense dust storm. Uh, it was my last day there, so I was so happy to be there. And uh, um, yeah, and I I wrote about this experience because it was really intense. And uh, so I want to read you a poem. <laughs> uh, who are you? Do you listen? Again and again and again. I am coerced into believing that I am merely a particle. I am among all the others. Do I sound the same? Does it matter? I will wait until I am fully seated. I am blind, so you can only listen. I listen again. You are intrusive. You are my neighbor who never stops ringing the bell. Billions of bells surround me. You want your voice to be heard. I cannot hear you from all the others. Why are you here? Go back immediately or forever join our tribe. Is this sex? Tell me your story. I find I found my way over the landscape. I touched the sunlight reaching through the mist. I waited until the wind asked me to fulfill, to fulfill my purpose. I glide, I touch your skin. I feel your eyes, so only your ears are alert. Sometimes it is necessary to change perspective, look differently at the present time. And then I was wondering if Paula could help me um, show the video. Um, uh, so I sent you a link, uh, but um, yeah. <laughs> if we can maybe see just like one minute of the video. Maybe you can just try to click on it yourself. It's amazing poet anyway. Um, so, <laughs> because you are sharing now, it should work through your computer. So let's see. If not, I will um, do it here. Um, do you see it? Oh. Do you see the video? Yeah, so you are probably sharing presentation and not desktop, right? Because we see your presentation. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, then I don't know if I can share it. But yeah, maybe, maybe you can just show it afterwards or something. Okay, okay. We can <laughs> find out. Yeah. Uh, do you see now the slides? Yes, in full screen. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, so uh, here are just some performances that I'm working on now. Um, and so there I'm kind of taking uh, more forward the, this uh, how scientists approach uh, their subject and uh, 
so I I was at the FMI or like a Finnish meteorology station and doing some measurements there and I was like doing it again and again and uh, uh, I felt really like dedicated somehow to the process and I wanted to marry the <laughs> the lab and uh, also a similar one a continuation was uh, here in the Finnish Laplands where I I made this uh, it's supposed to be a coffee filter and uh, that's connected to uh, what Audi is working on uh, where she would like get a uh, sample from all over Finland in coffee filters um, but yeah uh, so yeah so the Rani's project was uh, really successful it was uh, chosen one of the 13 project uh, uh, or 13 top projects I don't remember how many they were originally maybe like 200 or something uh, anyways and then I'm yeah working on this interdisciplinary master thesis and I will have an exhibition so thank you <laughs> Thank you, Maria. We welcome. And if, you, if you stop sharing your 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 um, screen, I will try to open it from here. I have saved the links here, so now I I have to share screen. Just a second. Share screen, desktop, and now so it's uh, which is is the number one? Is it listed? Uh, yeah, number one. Let's hope it's going to work. Sound is on maximum. Or okay, maybe you can click like in the middle or something. If we have to wait. For it. <laughs> All right, okay, it's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the <laughs> So yeah, in this performance, I would like, uh, I don't know, somehow it was really important to me to be kind of naked and to experience everything and feel the sand on me. And then I would uh, I had this jar and I collected like, uh, yeah, I don't know, a couple of grams in the, in the jar. And then I was recording the sound as well. And yeah, it was kind of almost like a religious um, performance or maybe not religious, but uh, very spiritual somehow.
yeah i don't know maybe it's enough it will it is uh, really sim uh, simple the whole time i just uh, sit up sometimes and lie down but uh, yeah if you have any questions i don't know <laughs> Yes, Maria, well, this is, I would never allow my students to do this. It's very unhealthy. <laughs> I, I, I really like your idea when you said we, like scientists are coming with the particulate mass concentrations and different sizes of particles, but you managed to express the scientific language with your body or experience the concentrations with your own body and lungs. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. I really congratulate you. And I'm it's hard to hear the bell which you are talking about. But uh, yeah, it, it, it didn't really work like uh, the recording because uh, like from the camera, uh, you could only hear like this annoying like <sighs> sound yeah, yeah. and then the the recording um, mainly recorded like the sound from the DR, for example. But um, yeah, but I, I recorded it in my memory. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I saw the hay and the, the dust plume increasing, the feeling came. I can feel the hardness and breathe. <laughs> yeah, <my laughs> you describe the sound of, of dust storm. How do you describe it? I, I remember you, was, you told about thousands of bells and something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really like it sounded like millions of bells around me, and I felt I felt like each of them had their individual sound. Yeah, it was it was really really beautiful. Yes, so if if you there agree. There is artwork on waterfalls, flowers. And biology and everything and, and, and uh, some of it of course quite famous but uh, this is sort of making ground going into a, a dust storm and portraying it that yeah and yeah. sacrificing yeah. yourself indeed <laughs> yeah it's yeah. yeah very unhealthy very unhealthy <laughs> <laughs> I have almost bad conscience just from seeing that. <laughs> nice. So if if there are no questions, I would like to really thank Maria and ask her if we could share the links in in either on ISDAS website or or with the maybe with the announcement of the workshop so people can watch it and concentrate more mm -hmm. in detail. Your yeah. Right. Okay. So thank you very much. And now we'll proceed to Natalia Burdova. I will just stop sharing here. And I hope Natalia is here with us. Hi, Natalia. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, I will then just share my screen as well, very fast. Natalia will show also results of her bachelor thesis on long range transport of dust events from Iceland. So that's the introduction. Okay, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, not in full, yeah, now in full screen. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I will just briefly continue on, on uh, what it was introduced before, of course, uh, Icelandic dust. But within my work, I was more um, looking into the long transport of, of this dust and specifically towards Europe. And uh, I would like to mention that there were a few studies before that were conducted on, on this topic, but they were usually on specific, like they were focused on specific events. And uh, there was never really done an overall um, study that was looking into a frequency of these uh, events within like a specific time. So this was something uh, that I was looking into within the past few months. Um, so first, uh, the aim and the research questions that I was um, 
I was focused on within the study. Uh, so I wanted to first look into the general dust activity in Iceland, uh, however, by using a different methodological approach than before. And uh, then I looked into the, the transport and its evidence toward uh, distant places from Iceland. And so the questions uh, were, what is the uh, dust activity in Iceland? Then what is the frequency of these events uh, with long range transport characteristics? And which area in the surrounding of Iceland experienced the highest uh, exposure to Icelandic dust? So uh, the methodology that I actually use, so first of all, as I said, I wanted to link, look into the general activity in Iceland. So I was trying to identify dusty days and dust events with the long range uh, transport uh, character. And that was done using by the available dream aid model that I believe was introduced before. And the criteria within this model was a surface dust concentrations over 50 micrograms per cubic meter in any part of Iceland. And I would like to say that since there can be several activities during one day when different parts of Iceland, I didn't specify these events, uh, I didn't specify single events uh, and a specific time, but any activity was basically noted as a day with occurrence of dust in Iceland. And then I was looking into the events or like the death, uh, the days that had the, the long range transport characteristics and those were identified as uh, the days where the surface concentrations that are within the model, um, that those concentrations were basically reaching any, um, any kind of level in the focus areas. Uh, then I chose several representative events and I was trying to somehow validate those events that I found within this time period, and then also trying to find proofs that these events happen. And I was trying to do this um, by using um, normally available tools, and those were, for example, Worldview, and there I was using uh, either satellite images or the aerosol optical depth layer, and then I was also uh, computing his but backward trajectories for these days and for the areas and uh, there that was basically to track the air parasols that could be possibly transporting the, the dust particles. And then thanks to um, Thanks to the other project that is uh, uh, that is concerning the, the Icelandic dust as well. Uh, uh, Hilda, I got the opportunity to, opportunity to get some results from in situ measurements and also from chemical analysis of of um, of different kinds of samples that are from Faroe Islands. So I choose again uh, specific some specific events, and from these I basically got data from this project that again we're trying to prove somehow the transport of the dust particles. So I would like to start with the general results of the dust activity. So I was investigating um, a time frame from January 2020 to 2021, and out of this uh, out of this year, 304 days were noted as uh, with um, dust activity in any part of Iceland, which is extremely high number, I would say. And uh, the highest occurrence of these days was uh, within the first half of the year. And out of these 304, the, the number of long range transport events or the days when there were characteristics of long range uh, uh, transport, that was 69. Out of these, the highest was for Faroe Islands, which experienced 14, seven, 47 days. Then for uh, United Kingdom and Ireland, it was 31, and then 18 for Scandinavia. And then I would like to just go through uh, three events uh, very quickly to just show you how basically I was using the methodological approach to look into the specific events. Uh, so, for example, I chose this event for uh, United Kingdom on the 6th of April. So, as you can see on, on the model, there was a really high activity around Iceland where the concentrations uh, were possibly reaching even uh, 500 micrograms per cubic meter. And this uh, dust load was traveling south from Iceland. And thanks to the atmospheric conditions, it was even shifted a tiny bit to, to, the, to the east. 
And uh, this uh, dust law was predicted to reach the area of uh, United Kingdom and possibly even uh, Iran. However, um, this part was not within that time projected in the, in the model. And then it was even traveling back to Faroe Islands. For that day, I looked into uh, the worldview and the different layers. So this is a, this is a screen from the aerosol uh, layer image. And uh, as you can see on the map, it somehow follows uh, the dust bloom, the dust slope that was projected on the, on the model. And of course, the, the more darker the color, the more uh, the higher concentrations were expected there or more particles. And then I uh, did the backward trajectories for that day for Ireland. And as you can see, again, it somehow follows uh, the IO passers fo follow the track that was projected in, uh, in the model before. Uh, then I have one more event for United Kingdom. Uh, again, as you can see on the model, there was a predicted activity that uh, possibly transported particles to United Kingdom. And here I just, uh, I'm not sure how much it is possible to be seen on the big screen. Uh, there was a dust plume that was visible even from the satellite images on that day. And then I picked one uh, event uh, from the Fiery Islands. And uh, on, the, on the right picture, I present like a, a graphical projection of uh, the wind direction, which corresponds to the ones that were predicted uh, in the, or forecasted in the, in the Dream 8 model. And then I had results from the chemical analysis that from the samples from Pari Islands. And within this whole, uh, whole um, analysis, I was mostly uh, like focused on two uh, groups. That was the silicate group, uh, which was presented by a uh, high percentage of, of um, uh, uh, silicon, ma magnesium, iron, aluminium, and uh, those are representative for Icelandic dust. And then, of course, the hematite-like uh, group, which naturally represents a really high content of iron, which again is somehow representative for Iceland. So basically, I went through several events like this that and I was trying to prove that these activities within the 69 days happened. Uh, so to conclude this, um, I was looking into the, the general activity in Iceland with a different uh, methodological approach than before. And that resulted in really high uh, dust uh, activity in the year 2020 in Iceland. And 304 dust days were noted within this time and uh, almost 23% out of these had a potential of long range transport towards Europe. Uh, this was, however, higher than, for example, previous studies suggested, but of course, this could be explained by several different reasons. And that's the methodological approach itself, because the sensitivity of, of, of it is different than also changing conditions in Iceland. Uh, because, for example, the year 2020, I found out that was quite dry and very windy compared to the other uh, compared to the other years. So there are several reasons why it could be this high compared to the previous studies. Um, then the dust emissions were mainly carried to the areas of Faroe Islands, which was the mainly exposed or most frequently exposed area with 47 events, and then also to United Kingdom and Norway. And uh, the deeper investigation of these several case studies uh, somehow supported the hypothesis that uh, the dust can be transported from Iceland to further distance regions. But it also underlined, of course, the challenges that we all are all aware and limitations that are connected to this type of research. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Natalia. Amazing study, really congratulations. Thank you. So, are there any questions here in the room? I, I, I knew it, Nichko is going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting study. Thank you. Uh, that, that's really good. Uh, in fact, it gives a, another view of what we are doing with the model. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have a su suggestion uh, for maybe your fu future or continuation of this kind of study. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And if I'm not wrong, unfortunately, there is no nobody from my group uh, in the mo- for the moment, but I can check. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that all the all the fields, all the outputs, uh, are available for this period. So mm-hmm. this means that uh, concentration in 3D or or 4 4D is available, but also some other parameters like uh, wet and dry deposition. If I'm mm-hmm. not wrong, mm-hmm. yeah. So this just gives gives you maybe. Uh, some idea for for either con- continuation of this study. I mean, the study you made already deserves even to be published, but of course you can add the value to, to this existing result. Thank you very much. We we uh, want to work on it a, a bit more, and then of course we would try to to send it for publishing. Uh, but it would be brilliant to to add something more to it. So thank thank you for this. Really. Mm-hmm. Okay, we, we we can talk more. Bilateral. Sure. <laughs> okay. Nice. Thank you very much. And since this is like the shortest and last section of our High Latitude Dust workshop, we have a small surprise at the end, and that will be the pictures from our camera from Dingyu Sandur from the summer campaign. And it was promised as a mini talk, a very short talk. So I would like to ask Alex, who was with us also during the campaign really, really hardworking person. So to show us a few of these images. Thank you, Alex. Hi, hi. Uh, so can you can you see my presentation? You have to share. Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you. So just very quickly, I will compare uh, August of this year or uh, oh, last year with the August of 2020 in Dingyu Sandur, where we installed our camera for the first time. In the background, you can actually see the Dingyu Sandur in winter. This is picture taken by the end of October, and it's without any filter, so hashtag no filter. Uh, the blackness of the of the sand with whiteness of uh, of the snow really makes amazing combination, which is something uh, Maria might be interested in that. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so all of you probably by now know where Dingyu Sandur is. Um, it's north of Vatnayaku uh, Glacier. Uh, you can see it as the the right mark on the map. Uh, we did a setup on the on the left. This is the setup of 2020. Uh, the camera survived uh, with small damage, which we're going to see in a, in a second. And the picture on the right is taken by Maria. Um, it's me, uh, Brian, who helped us, and Pavla. This is actually the first, first checkup after the winter. Uh, the top picture is from 2020. The, the bottom picture is from 2021. As you can see, the right part is damaged. Uh, one of the lenses was scratched pretty badly, uh, so you can clearly see where the pictures are stitched together. It doesn't really make it easier for me to catch the dust storms, uh, but most of them are happening on the left side anyway. So this is the view uh, of Vatnaik with the plane that can get flooded, which is visible as well sometimes from the camera pictures. And now the comparison of dust storms, you can see um, how it's a bit less visible on the bottom picture, uh, but still it's notable. Uh, one more picture, the bottom picture is again from 2021 where we were uh, by the tower. Uh, the dust storms were much more severe than last year. And as a conclusion, uh, out of 23 days for both of the August, there were 19 compared to 13 days in 2020 of dust active days. So it really was much more uh, dust than I expected. It's still ongoing study, so I don't have really that many information to, to share with you. Uh, but dust is getting more and more active. So I'm really curious to see what's going to happen in ongoing months. So this is everything from my part. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pablo and Oti, for hosting this. 
and hopefully see you next year. Thank you, Alex. This was really nice to see at the end. So I would like to thank all the speakers of the section once again. Thank you. It's hard to believe it's over. So thank you everybody for being here on site, but also here online and following our workshop. We will distribute the recordings later and, and we are already looking forward to the next year, but I believe with many of you, we will see us also during the field campaigns this year here in Iceland or during the conferences elsewhere. So that's my final words from me. I don't know if Oti wants to say something too. Yes, also thanks from my side to, to all participants and presenters and of course, Pavla. So very nice <laughs> workshop again. So thank you. Okay, so thank you all. <laughs>